Welcome to the meeting of the Family, Children, and Custody Subcommittee of the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group. I can start by taking roll. Um, Rashawn, I don't believe Sharon is here yet. Um, Hamilton? Present. McRae? Here. Olvera? Here. Darouche? Here. And Judge Wiley? Present. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so what I'd like to do um, uh, before taking, see if there are any members, are there any members of the public present? Yes, there are. Okay, okay. so to uh, those folks, if you have questions or comments uh, before we start, um, I'm gonna give you um, time to ask your question um, or make your comments. And uh, what my plan is for today um, is to kind of uh, quickly review what we've done so far and then um, go over uh, uh, and uh, try to come up with some sort of a consensus regarding uh, guardianship, general conservatorship, uncontested non-step parent adoptions, um, and in-court representation as to all of our issues. Um, I do have um, another expert present today. Uh, Bob, where did Bob go? Bob's here. Oh, you're here. There you go. All right. Robert Collier, and I'll introduce him in just a moment. Um, and then at the end, I kind of want us to quickly uh, plan for our upcoming um, joint session and our presentation. So, um, so far, uh, we, we've had detailed discussion about family law topics, and we sort of changed our approach um, around to, instead of listing what we think should be included uh, in tasks and issues that uh, we want paraprofessionals to be authorized to handle, to what's excluded, because it's a much shorter list, okay? So this is what we came up with. Um, um any uh, um, any comments on uh this oh there's sharon any comments or questions on this list um let's get to it after i allow the public to ask their questions um and then next slide okay and again as to adoption, um, it's a short list. Uh, we've only considered these two, the dependency petition, uh, uh, adop adoptions basically come out of dependency court and then uncontested step-parent adoptions. Uh, we had that wonderful presentation uh, by Mary Feldman and we decided on uh, including uh, basically uh, assistance prior to a case being opened in the juvenile dependency court and then after um, a disposition of the case, but before the case is exited into a family law case where um, the parties do not have a right to counsel, then paraprofessionals should be able to assist with those. We went over all types of violence prevention orders and decided to include all of those. And then we talked about, um, we decided only as to limited conservatorships and decided to include uncontested limited conservatorships, okay? And today we are going to talk about guardianships, general conservatorships, and like I said, uncontested non-parent adoption and in court representation. Okay, are there um, any questions or comments from the public? It looks like we have, oh, sorry, we have one person with their okay. hand up. I can go ahead and allow them to speak. All right. Did you want to set a time limit? On yes, public yes, three minutes. Okay. So we don't have many people. Right, just a moment. Okay. We have um, Jean Matulas. Hi there. I'm you. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Jean Matulis. I'm an attorney and I do a lot of appellate work 
Um, a lot of my clients are con people on conservatorship, particularly LPS conservatorship, although I have done other types of conservatorships as well. Uh, and um, I've done also some work at the trial level uh, uh, as well, but mostly appellate. Um, one of the concerns that I have regarding conservatorship, um, uh, there are, um, when, when, when we're, first of all, when you're talking about unlimited, or the, excuse me, the limited uncontested, that kind of concerns me because a person might just be kind of going along with it and not might not be truly uncontested unless they have the advice of counsel and 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 in and so that 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 kind of concerns me because it's been my experience that sometimes the parents have placement um powers you know in in putting them putting people in you know certain settings and and it and it might be a way of unfortunately unless there is their right to counsel or uh you know that ability to have counsel, that uh, the, the due process rights might be involved. The other, the other issue, I know that there's a difference between probate conservatorships and LPS mental health conservatorships. So I'm actually yes. going to stop you right there. Oh, I'll sure. ask you your first question. Uh, okay. Uh, Bob Collier, who is our expert today, tells me that in every limited conservatorship case, the conservatee is appointed the public defender as counsel. Oh, okay, okay, that's what I was, okay. Oh, that's a wonderful clarification. I greatly appreciate that. That was my well, primary- is that correct? I wanna make sure that I said that correctly. Yeah, I just wanna say that my experience is, is with how matters were handled in probate court in Santa Clara County. And in Santa Clara County, every limited, proposed limited conservatee has the public defender appointed to represent them. Okay. Uh, okay. And so I would want that. I would. I would like. I. I would like that. If you're going to do some sort of state paraprofessional thing, I guess maybe you're just talking about maybe helping the parents then, and not the person who is the subject of the conservatorship. That would make a difference to me. My primary concern is that the person who's subject to conservatorship has the full benefits of the right to an attorney. So we are talking about only helping the petitioner, the parents. I get parents, it. If they're competing applications because the parents happen to be separated, divorced or whatever, right? We're not talking about paraprofessionals helping conservatives in these cases. Okay, right? that is huge. And I, I greatly appreciate that clarification. The other thing is that um, in terms of people with, uh, you know, that the, the other kinds of conservatorship, I would hope that that would also apply across the board, whether it be probate conservatorships or the mental health, the Latham and Petra Short Act conservatorships, that it would be the person on conservatorship would still have the right to attorney and not be represented as, as, as you say. And, and so I hope that that would go across the board with any type of conservatorship. So again, uh, do, based on my conversation with Bob, and Bob, please correct me if I'm wrong, as to general conservatorships, uh, there is a right to, uh, when there's an objection mm -hmm. to the petition, there is a right to counsel, uh, but there's, um, I don't think I can put it that way. If the conservative is indigent, the court appoints a public defender if the conservative is not indigent, the estate, their estate will pay for attorney's fees. Did I get that right? Yes. Um, the court can appoint an attorney in any conservatorship case if the court feels it um, would be helpful. Uh, as, as with regard to the conservatee, which I know you're not exactly concerned with, the court, uh, we already said though, there will be a public defender appointed in limited conservatorships. In general conservatorships, the court will always appoint an attorney if the conservatee objects. And again, it's an attorney for the conservatee. And uh, whether it's the public defender or somebody else depends on if the proposed conservatee has assets. Does that answer your question or address your concern? Well, again, it, it sounds like it sounds like as long as the conservatee, it, their rights are not altered by this paraprofessional thing. And it doesn't sound like there is from what you're saying, you know, that it wouldn't be the conservatee, like uh, LPS, you're automatically appointed the conservator. In a probate conservatorship, there is discretion as, as, mis, as, as Mr. Collier, I hope I pronounced that correctly, stated. 
that, that that's and that isn't affected by this, whether it's a paraprofessional or, you know, so in other words, the conservatory always has the right to an attorney that hasn't been changed. It's just like you say, maybe the petitioner. Uh, right. So members of the committee, correct me if I'm wrong, we've sorry. never contemplated having a paraprofessional uh, uh, represent the conservatee in either limited conservatorship or general conservatorship cases, uh, right? We've, at least I've never contemplated that, okay? It's, That's very assuring and I appreciate very much your, your time. No, your Thank question you. is actually helpful to clarify that point. I don't think we have clarified that before, but this is good. Okay. All right, anybody else? No, okay. I don't see anyone else who has their hand raised. Okay, moving on. I know, uh, Bob, you can't stay long, so I want to get to guardianships and conservatorships first, as is on the agenda. Uh, so let me introduce Bob, uh, Robert Collier. Bob uh, uh, used to work for our court for 20 years, up to, what, two years ago, Bob? Time flies, I don't know. A year, a year and a half. A year and a half, okay. And he retired before that. He was a probate um, uh, attorney. Um, in private practice for 19 years. At our court, he was our probate staff attorney and um, he reviewed every uh, guardianship, and correct me if I'm wrong, guardianship and conservatorship case uh, before it went to the judge and then kind of prepared the case for the judge and was present in court for all those hearings. Did I get that right, Bob? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't write up the prep for the cases. The probate examiners did that. I always reviewed their, their uh, summaries and prep sheets and things like that. Uh, if there's something that needed to be added or changed, I would discuss that with them. But I would meet with the judge prior to uh, every guardianship and conservatorship uh, hearing, not the trials, but other hearings. And then the judge and I would go over the cases. And then I sat in the courtroom for all of these hearings in case the judge had a question. Uh, which is a really useful uh... Uh, v, uh, viewpoint to have here because you observed a lot of hearings, both with uh, represented people and self-represented litigants, and um, and you can share with us all the great information you shared with me. So as to guardianships, um, I'm pretty much um, I've had, like I said, extensive conversation with Bob. And for both guardianships and conservatorships, they're very form intensive, just like family law. Okay, and their judicial counsel forms for everything. And at our self help center, we help with those forms. And so Bob's position, and I'm going to let you speak for yourself, though, is that the paraprofessional para uh, could be trained to help with um, the forms up until uh, for, and for uncontested cases and be able to even be in court to answer question, procedural questions with, from the court. And there are a couple of actually non-attorneys right now that we're not gonna name them that um, do that actually right now in court. Um, so, so Bob, could you expand on that a little bit with regards to the forms and you can just divide guardianships and conservatorship and what your experience has been with self-represented litigants and then if you've seen paralegals or non-attorneys be present in court? Well, I think paralegals can certainly be trained to fill out the forms. And as a matter of fact, in our court, uh, for guardianships, um, self-represented people uh, would go to our court self-help center, Freeva, which you uh, direct, and uh, that's where they were filled out the best. Um, uh, paralegals would sometimes help people uh, fill out the forms. They didn't do a very good job often. Uh, but uh, they really weren't trained to do it. They were just somebody that the person found. Uh, the other exception besides self-help center was Catholic Charities. And they represented, uh, or they helped people fill out forms in certain kinds of cases. And uh, lots of those were uncontested, a specific kind, those were refugees, they were all uncontested. For the contested ones, uh, there was a branch of Catholic Charities that helped people fill out the forms. They would show up in court, but they were not there to argue the merits of the case. 
they were there in case the judge had a question, a procedural question about how the forms were filled out, or sometimes even if they were served, because sometimes they would serve them. But uh, they didn't uh, argue the case. In conservative, those are guardianships I'm talking about. In conservatorships, we very rarely had paralegals fill out the forms. Uh, for one thing, in most conservatorships, uh, the people would have an attorney because that attorney could be paid out of the assets of the proposed conservatee. And I'm talking about an attorney for the petitioner, all right? They would have to petition for that and justify it, but often they could be paid out of those assets. So they have attorneys. Where there were represented people, uh, I never saw a, a private, a, a, a paralegal show up in court and I did not very often at all see a paralegal fill out the forms. The people would get it, some help at the self-help center. And actually in my office, we also had samples of the forms, blank ones and samples. And if they were in a big hurry, um, we'd let them fill them out there. And we just take a look to see if they filled in all the spaces and all that. But again, I very rarely saw paralegals uh, involved in um, conservatorship cases. Do you see any problems with, uh, with training para paraprofessionals? We're gonna, you know, so right now we're calling them paraprofessionals, uh, being trained to do conservatorship forms, just like guardianship forms. Is there something more complicated about uh, conservatorship forms, um, uh, especially that would need an attorney uh, I think they could be trained to fill. Out, I think they could be trained to fill out the forms. I would assume that the training uh, would be completed when the the uh, trainer was satisfied that the person knew what they were doing. But yeah, okay. they could be trained to fill out forms. Mm -hmm. And I do recall we've had other speakers on this topic before. I do remember um, there was a mention for conservatorships that you have to. Have, uh, doctor's reports and, and, and things like that that have to be included in the application or at some point be provided to the court. Um, do you think that presents a complexity that would require an attorney rather than a paraprofessional? No, as a medical matter, um, most of the time, if somebody was self-represented, they were able to get the forms, uh, the evaluation done by the doctor because maybe they had a relationship with them all ready through the family. If they were having difficulty, uh, we found that either it would finally come later on or we'd have them fill out the HIPAA form authorizing the doctor to fill out the form. And uh, that would almost always do it. Uh, I've never seen a court order a doctor to fill out a form. Okay, do we have any questions so far? Um, Marika, I, I just have a ahead. question. Are, when we're talking about filling out forms, because um, right now LDAs can fill out forms, you know, folks can fill out forms now. So, uh, so I think with the paraprofessional, we're talking about something beyond just filling out a form, right? Yeah, we're, we're going to get to that. So okay, I'm right. approaching the stage by stage. Okay. Okay. That's okay. That's okay, which is what I was just about to do. But I wanted to kind of point out also the uh, role of a court investigator in these cases, um, especially. Um, and I, I, I want to ask Bob to explain to us the role of a court, interpret, uh, court investigator in guardianship, conservatorships, and I know you don't do adoptions, but they're also involved in adoptions, right? Yes, that's right. I don't do adoptions, but uh, in fact, I don't know if court investigators do adoptions because I had nothing to do with adoptions. Okay, so let's just stick with guardianships and conservatorships. And the role that the court investigator plays, that's a unique role that's not you know, present in our family law cases. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, they don't get involved. Well, actually, in I'm not surprised, but... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but court investigators are very much involved in guardianships and conservator, general conservatorships. They, uh, they uh, make uh, visits that are uh, prescribed by statute. Uh, they are also required to fill out evaluations that again are prescribed by statute and provide those to the judge and to uh, sometimes to the parties. 
and uh, they the judge relies a lot on court investigators in both guardianships and conservatorships. Okay, so the court investigator can even be called to testify if there's a trial. Okay, so talking about great segue. So the question really here is, as Leah mentioned, we're, we're talking about more than just filling out forms. We're talking about when a case gets contested. Okay, and to what extent should the, the question is, should the paraprofessional be involved in a litigated guardianship case? And the next question, conservatorship. Um, the way I look at it is that for somebody to conduct a trial, they need to be trained. As a matter of fact, even lawyers need to be trained. Uh, you're just fresh out of law school, you may not know how to conduct a trial. And so you can take MCLE courses or special courses to learn how to do that. I don't know uh, how well that would work training a paraprofessional to conduct a trial. I know that, uh, as I said, I can't recall seeing one in a conservatorship case. Uh, in the guardianship cases where I saw them, they were just there to deal with procedural issues. I don't know how they would decide what, uh, what evidence should be presented, uh, what arguments to make. Um, I, I, it would it just seemed to be beyond what they would be uh, qualified to do. And I think we talked about this yesterday with regards to um, uh, the uh, code sections that allow for a conservator, a proposed conservator to ask for attorney's fees. Um, and of course that's at the discretion of the court, but that is possible in, under the probate code. That's right. You look at probate code section 2640 in the following sections. And somebody who's petitioned to be appointed conservator uh, can request their attorney's fees if they uh, are appointed. If they're not appointed uh, and someone else is appointed, they can also petition for their attorney's fees. If there's no conservatorship established, I don't recall seeing anywhere in section 2640 area where they would be entitled to fees. And this includes their attorney as well. Okay. Any questions for Bob? So we now, thank you, Bob. Now, so with regards to guardianships and conservatorships, and I'm kind of grouping them together because I think the question is the same, that we know that we're gonna, I mean, uh, they're gonna uh, be, uh, paraprofessionals are gonna be authorized to fill out the forms. But um, I, since Bob is here, I wanna just kind of touch on whether uh, we're gonna limit it to uncontested cases or uh, which is my position or um, are is anyone here advocating for allowing them to also do work in contested cases dana i want to make sure that since guardianship is considered a, a long-term plan in juvenile dependency that we are excluding that kind of a guardianship that happens in dependency court absolutely uh, uh, Fariba, yes. I was thinking that um, I saw no problem with a paraprofessional filling out forms, even in a contested case, just the petition, the kind of things to get it moving. It was it's representing somebody in court that okay. I see as a problem. Okay. That, I meant that. If I didn't say it that way, that's what I meant as well. Because we don't know at the outset where the a case is going to be contested. So as soon as the case gets contested, they've got to sub out. And they might even, well, you mentioned sub out. The, again, the only time I see uh, paraprofessionals uh, appear, again, I can't recall when in conservatorships, but in guardianships, there's one in Santa Clara County does a pretty good job. She never appears in court, but it's the Catholic Charities paralegals that show up and uh, the judge will have some procedural questions for them. Okay, 
So that's the different levels of representation. You know, I kind of try to keep the discussion separate. Like we're going to discuss in court representation at the end, but you can't help but kind of let some of that seep in. That is, you know, kind of um, this range of not even show up in court to full representation. And then in the middle, you have a silent advocate or, um, or an advocate that would answer uh, judges direct procedural questions. So those are like the four um, levels of um, involvement in court representation we're talking about. So it, does anyone have a different position? That is, does anyone here think that uh, paraprofessionals should be allowed to um, represent a client in a contested guardianship case? Okay. okay. I do not. Okay. So Fariba, just to clarify, when you say represent, you're referring to in-court representation. Because the, the question that I have is beyond filling out forms, what someone might do to advise people about which avenue to pursue, which forms to use. And so um, I think that that's sort of the, an in-between step besides the filling out forms, which LDAs can do if the client has picked out the forms, they can get assistance in filling out forms. I think we're envisioning for paraprofessionals a role expanded beyond what LDAs and even uh, paralegals currently are allowed to do, which is to actually provide advice and guidance. Yes. Thank you for pointing that out. Sure we clarify that. That's my understanding as well. Um, I think that all the way to the point of where it becomes a contested uh, case where there has to be legal argument, there has to be litigation. We're, I think as part of this, we are training paraprofessionals to give legal advice, to become experts, specialists in the area that they select. Okay, so it's family law, that would include guardianships and conservatorships. What I am saying, and I, this is where it kind of crosses over to the in-court representation is, they should not be allowed to make legal arguments and litigate the case. Does anybody have a different understanding? Okay, so Steve doesn't, Sharon. Okay, I think we're all on the same page here. Okay. Um, anyone have any questions for Bob? Because I know he has to go. Okay. Thank you, Bob. All right. You're welcome for your Really nice appreciate nice your you time. All. Thank All you. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. So I was not able to uh, get any more information or and get uh, talk to any um, experts regarding adoptions, uh, non-step parent adoptions. Um, I have to tell you that they're also form intensive. The forms are, look like um, other judicial counsel forms. So um, my, uh, uh, my proposal is to also kind of be consistent and allow for um, paraprofessionals to um, assist in uncontested non-step parent adoptions as well excluding anything out of juvenile dependency, like we said. Does anyone want to be heard on that? Okay. All right. Making it easy today. <laughs> All right. So I, I, just want, I just wanted to clarify. So now the, the, this, it sounds like there was agreement that uncontested guardianships and uncontested general conservative Chairships would be included. Is that correct? I believe that's. Uh, we haven't decided. Uh, co completely come to that. You know, decided yet. But nobody had an objection or a question or anything like that. I believe that's right. Okay. okay. All right. Now we become uh, come to in court representation. I think just by way of since we are on the topic of conservatorships and guardianships. I, let's just start there. Um, having talked to Bob and, and, and read the material and just um, 
considering what we have, all of us have discussed so far, I think that um, I would want um, for a paraprofessional to be able to be present as a support person uh, and be able to answer direct procedural questions from the court. Because a lot of times that really helps things out, um, but nothing beyond that. And I want to hear from committee members. From all subject areas, or were you referring to? No, I'm just talking about conservatorships You're and guardianships, right? Conservatorship. I think we should really divide them. And I'm sorry, can you recap very briefly? Sure. Uh, so just for conservatorships and guardianships, that's all. Okay. That they, in terms of being in court, they'll be allowed to be in court standing at counsel's table next to their client, but only for support and to answer any direct procedural questions from the judge. And Sharon has her hand up. Thank you, Fariba. Um, I am just wondering in this in these scenarios, um, I, I guess it goes back to an objection that Steve Hamilton had a while back, and I know this was like CLA's concern as well, of how much of that is advocacy. Um, and I, I guess I just don't know, and I want to open it up to discussion because at face value, I think that I would agree with you, Fariba to have a support person to um, answer procedural questions. I think that it can help clarify things to the court. It would be a great service to the clients. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering how much of this could fall into the advocacy route. Steve? Yeah, and for me, based on my constituency, and instead of taking these individually at the start, I would like to actually make a motion that it gets a vote as to whether or not there'll be any in-court representation in family law matters. I think I before I can have a discussion about specific areas and specific limitations, I think I'm obligated to ask for, for a, a vote or a position on any in-court representation in family law. Well, the thing I, I, and I, and I'm, I'm fully aware of what I expect that outcome of that vote to be. But I've, I am also fully aware I need to request that vote mm -hmm. at the beginning of this conversation before I engage in dialogue If once we know that's off the table. You mean full in-court representation, right? Was, no, no my, I'll, I'll actually make the motion, even though I don't know if we're allowed to do it in subcommittees, but my motion would be not to allow paraprofessionals to provide any in-court representation within any of the uh, areas. So Steve, do you think, um, let me just jump in for one second. Since there was a default vote taken by the working group as a whole to allow in-court representation, I think the thought was that the work, I think the thought, sorry for not speaking all that coherently. Um, I believe that the intention was that of course, subcommittees could deviate from that but there would have to be a rationale for doing so, which is why I think Fariba was starting to go through the list. Um, Understood. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not clear why a subcommittee would take another kind of blanket vote on whether there should be in court. I mean, I leave it up to you. I'm not a member of the subcommittee, um, but I just do remind everyone that there was a default position taken on behalf of the working group as a whole. And, and then of course, in particular areas, one could deviate based upon a, you know, whatever justification you feel is appropriate. Okay, so I think you're aware that that vote of the committee, the entire committee has gotten a lot of attention from multiple bar associations. It's got CLA's attention. And what I'm saying is I would like to be able to engage in a discussion about what things should be drawn back I am in the position of having to request and making a motion to first argue that there should be no in-court representation in family law matters before I engage in that discussion. Okay. Well, I think rather than our going back and forth is probably most time efficient for you to do so. Um, and I'll let the chair the, of the subcommittee take it from here. There's a motion and clearly now we need a second and, and a vote. I would second that. Well, can, can we, um, 
I'll give the motion is to exclude any in court representation in family law cases. Exclude. Yeah, exclude, right. Regardless of the area. Right. Altogether. All right, so, we have a second. Do we have discussion? I'll start the discussion. So, <laughs> so if you remember the when we had our speaker on child welfare issues, um, there is a right to counsel uh, in, in most of the stages. So that's not going to be too big of a concern. But uh, there's one specific um, uh, instance where there's a petition uh, for change filed. And um, where the, especially when the parents file it, it, they're highly emotional. A lot of these families are highly dysfunctional. They're not able to speak for themselves. Um, and at the outset, because as soon as the case gets going, the way I understand how things go there, that there is um, soon after that, if there's litigation, there's a right to counsel and counsel will be appointed. But that's first step is so important that just a little bit of help from an unemotional, detached, well-trained, hopefully, paraprofessional could make the difference between that case being stopped in its tracks in the beginning where the parent cannot provide the information, the judge even needs to go to the second step and having the case go forward and that parent be appointed counsel and, and then have a meaningful um, hearing and pr uh, process in trying to, you know, get more visitation, change the order that they're asking for. So in grouping them together, I think we're doing a disservice to those types of cases. So because we're covered by Bagley Keen rules, I can't have phone calls with all of you in anticipation of this meeting to explain why I'm asking for what I'm asking for. And we are in a situation where it's a publicly re recorded meeting and I'm being put in a very untenable position. And I'm just asking for a vote on this issue. Oh, can I make a recommendation that unless someone else wishes to be heard, I, I don't know. I mean, I think Fariba that there will be conversation regarding the particular subtopics, right? You have in-court representation. I'm sure there will be discussion on those. I'm not, um, unless someone wishes to be heard, of course be heard, but I don't know that there really needs to be more discussion at all at this point regarding the motion. I think you should, I would recommend that you take the vote on the motion. And then if it does not pass, you continue on and have your substantive conversation regarding in-court representation in these you know, delineated areas. If I'll, that's I'll, okay with um, Steve Hamilton as well. Please, that, that's exactly what I was suggesting. Of course I can do that. It's just, I thought the point of the discussion was to try to kind of get um, the, uh, uh, dissuade the vote, the people who are voting one way or another, but that's fine. We can take a vote. Um, so go ahead, uh, Linda. Okay. Um, Rashawn? Oh, yeah. Elizabeth has their answer. I don't know. Oh, Elizabeth, <laughs> okay. Take that or no? <laughs> you want to continue the discussion then, um, Elizabeth? I mean, I'd like Before to give her a chance to talk. Yeah. I'm um, so. Again, Elizabeth Olvera, just wanted to say that um, we've already took a vote um, with the higher group and we voted that um, in-court representation would be a viable option in certain situations. And um, I just reminding everyone that um, the reason we do this is because the alternative to not um, voting that allowing court in-court representation is that people will have no assistance the way they have now and it's an access to justice issue. And I know I'm just repeating myself, but again, um, I just wanted to be heard on that matter, thanks. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other hands, um, so let's take a vote. Okay, Bashan. Yes. Hamilton? Yes. McRae? No. Olvera? No. Arush? No. And Judge Wiley? No. Okay, the motion does not carry. Thank okay. you, I appreciate that. Okay, so um, I then I can, guess I can go back to discussing each area, yeah? Okay, so let's go back to 
conservatorships and guardianships, um, and really adoptions as well. Um, that is the paraprofessional be allowed to be in court. Uh, you know, I'm thinking maybe I should make a motion just like Steve did and have a discussion. What do you think about that? Let's figure that out. Just have a motion as to like, I like to group adoption guardianships and conservatorships together and have a vote on that. Uh, I make a motion that the, um, the power professional be allowed to appear in court in, next to their client and answer procedural questions from the court. Do you have a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? All right, well, let's take a vote. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm recording because I hadn't prepared voting slips for this meeting. So it's uh, taking me a minute to catch up. So for adoption, guardianship, and conservatorship to, to be uh, uh, to be able to um, in, in court to support and answer questions. Procedural questions directly from the judge. Okay. Elizabeth, is your other hand up for this or was it up from before? Oh, it was up for previous. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, but Fariba, were you, were you saying that um, if we vote right here that we're saying that for those specific categories, that is the extent of the facilitation and assistance? That's my motion, yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I understood. Okay. Thank All you. Right. I do, uh, Steve seconded it, and uh, now I see Sharon. Did you have a question? I thought I saw I your hand was up. Um, actually, um, Elizabeth addressed my question. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay. All right. Any other comments, questions, discussion? Uh, Dana. Fariba, can you clarify that included in your motion is the idea that once a contested, once somebody opposes whatever this action is, the paraprofessional has to get out? No, actually, I think they can still uh, be there, but they can only answer direct procedural questions from the judge. They cannot engage in legal argument uh, and, and, and litigation, nothing like that. All right, if there's no other discussion, let's take a vote. Sean. Yes. Hamilton. Yes. McGray. No. Olvera. No. Sarush. Yes. And uh, Judge Wiley. No. Oh, actually, so now we have a tie. <laughs> Who's the tie break? Um, I don't, it's interesting because I don't what are think the procedural have the same rules, rules for, uh, for the subcommittee, but Su Suzanne is our expert. Yeah, I thought it did is. not carry if it was a time, yeah, that's what I but I'm not the expert. Suzanne, are you, are you there? Can you answer a question for us? I'm not sure if Suzanne has stepped away. I remember a call from FlexCon meeting, Steve. I, I don't think motion carries if there's a tie, right? Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah, Robert's rules of order tie tie vote uh, fails. Yeah, same in government. Tie is no action. I think that's right. Okay. okay. All right. Well, well, we can all agree on what the rules are that we don't actually know, but we're going with it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I. Not recalling correctly that our the committees don't necessarily have to uh, have a consensus. That is, we can put for two positions to the full group, and then the full group votes. I think that's right. I think what we could do. So everybody who voted no to that, so that would be Judge Wiley, Elizabeth, and Dana. Um, probably is taking, I'm going to make a wild leap of faith here is to not limit them and allow them to do full court representation. So I think we could skip a vote and just say we've got a three, you know, the group is divided and our report back to the 
uh, working group as a whole would be that half of us believe there should be the limitation and half of us not. And somebody from each voting block should then write the position for that group or help Linda with it. Yeah, I think that's key to have a justification. Okay, are we allowed to uh, discuss that outside of here? Like the three of us who voted no and two of us, okay. No, all of, all of the deliberations have to happen in a public meeting. I see, mm -hmm. and then so like, for example, who's gonna uh, write the position for the uh, yes votes? That has to be discussed here, right? Steve, can you write? So, so I will draft a, <laughs> Uh, as I've done with prior memos, I will draft a memo um, and circulate it. And then each of you will need to individually respond. And if there's, and hopefully there won't be serious conflict that, uh, that I'll be able to just incorporate the responses okay. and they won't conflict with each other. Okay, very good. Thank you. Could we go back to the list? So, so um, but just to help me as in my drafting, uh -huh. uh, because the, uh, the, the, the recommend the overall recommendation that's sort of the baseline is full in court representation, but no jury trials. So the deviation from that is to limit representation, to, to limit the paraprofessional's role to being a support person and answering procedural questions from the judge. So if you wanna just tell me like in this meeting, what the rationale is for the deviation from the, the standard recommendation, then that will help me in my initial draft. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also is a useful discussion to have in the public in a public meeting. Mm -hmm. So it is my opinion that at that point, when it gets to litigation, we're not crossing over to um, uh, a turn, uh, being an attorney, having a license to actually practice law. There is a difference between being a paraprofessional and being an attorney. Otherwise, it would be unfair to the paraprofessional to say, hey, you could practice just like an attorney, but you have to charge less. Or you're, you're not an attorney. You're not going to be called an attorney. They're not going to go to law school. They're going to go to paraprofessional school. So if we're saying, hey, you could do everything, including in-court representation, then why do we have a separate group called paraprofessional? Why aren't they going to law school? I just have not been able to figure that out, you know? And again, I just think it's unfair to treat them differently. Tell them, hey, you're subject to fee caps. You're subject to this rule and that rule and the other rule that attorneys are not subject to. So I think there is a difference. I compare it to medical professionals, you know, medical um, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, they go to, to certain schools, they get certain education. Yes, they can do some things like a doctor does, but they can't do everything. When they get to surgery, that's it. They don't do it. They're not trained to do it. They don't do it. So if we're going to now have uh, trial advocacy courses in paraprofessional school, I'm gonna know what the difference is with being a lawyer. What is that line? It's just too, too, it's just too convoluted for me. I don't understand it. We're not training them to be lawyers and this is lawyer work. I, I would like to point out that the decision discussion about fee caps that's, that hasn't happened yet. So there has not been, a, a decision has not been made that fee caps will necessarily be imposed. I do get that, but this is an access to justice project. We're contemplating that these paraprofessionals will cost less than attorneys. And we say that in every single meeting. And that's why this is a great project. That's why more self-represented litigants will be able to afford counsel. But if we're telling, empowering the paraprofessionals to do everything a lawyer can, then why should they charge less? Why shouldn't they go to law school? Why, you know, just, it's an artificial, separation to me, just so that we can create this group of professionals that are not gonna charge less. So more uh, litigants in, in these areas of law can afford to hire advocates, legal advocates. Steve and Sharon, do you have anything to add? Oh, Sharon's hands up. Yeah, I'm gonna actually piggyback on everything you just said. It's 
not only unfair to the paraprofessionals, but it's also unfair to um, attorneys where in certain areas, this profession is going to totally eclipse what they are doing. For me, like I've devoted my entire career to access to justice. So, you know, I'm all about access to justice. And that's usually my first inquiry. Is this going to create more access to justice? But that's not the end of my inquiry. I also ask myself, is this a good idea in this specific space and area of law? And you know where I push back is when the answer is no, either due to training or due to um, you know slippery slope. And I agree with you, Fariba, that you know like where is that line of what um, a paraprofessional can do and what uh, an attorney can do? Because it's not just about access to justice, but if all of a sudden paraprofessionals are able to do trial advocacy. And represent in court in these, um, you know, life and death situations where children are at stake. And for um, attorneys, usually that's a specialty. A brand new attorney, while they can go into court and represent in certain areas, like they often don't, and they often don't do it well because it's not their specialty. So I just don't want, like, I want to um, be part of a program that thrives at the heart of this. Like, I do believe in access to justice, and I know that we have a justice gap. But I also don't want um, a program to crash and fail because we've um, allowed too much at this juncture. And that's not to say that at a different, you know, this is a pilot that at a different juncture, once we have data, we don't open up classes, um, you know, to, to this, to, to, I guess, doing more in court. But that's just where I stand on this. And I think that comment about a fully functioning pilot too makes sense in the regards that it will be easier to expand the scope of duties for a paraprofessional and we'll have a better idea what should be included or added to the educational and training regimen to allow for the in-court representation as opposed to in-court um, assistance. And I think it's premature to, to do it at this stage. So I know that we first started having these conversations about um, conservatorship, guardianship, and adoptions, but I just wanted to um, reiterate the point of why we're even considering. Um, but um, also, I think that if the paraprofessional is allowed to give legal advice, then we're gonna and we're gonna be able to give and settlement negotiations. Sorry, we're gonna be able to negotiate. And we're going to be able to draft stipulations and we're going to be able to meet with the clients and really get an understanding of what their wants are, what their needs are, what is their goal based on the specific situation. Then we're going to be able to hopefully eliminate more court processes um, through the settlement agreements, through divorce, through the stipulations with the other parents for visitation. And so I, I think we're thinking that there's going to be a lot of more paraprofessionals in court. And I think that that might not necessarily be. And that's why this program is happening so that we can test and pivot as needed. Um, what else? I, know I actually think we don't, um, at this point, we understand that there are these two different positions. And I don't know that we need to argue. I, I was looking for information for the rationale from deviating from the standard. I think in terms of making these arguments that can happen with the full at, at the full working group meeting. I'm, I don't mean to just you. cut you off, oh, Elizabeth, you, but I think um, we you. do need to move through the rest of the topics. Okay. Any other comments? All right. So let's go back to that list. Okay, let me just uh, bring that up again. Um, okay, um, next I want to take up uh, child welfare. And could you go to this slide that says what issues in child welfare we're including? I think this right here. Okay. So what we're talking about really is um, 
the second bullet point. Because before that, they're just dealing with administratively with the DFCS, with the um, Department of Family Children's Services. Um, it's really not in court representation. And that's the scenario that I was giving originally where um, a parent or really that petition could be filed by anyone to request a change. And as soon as they get into court and at some point, uh, there's right to appoint a counsel. So I'm, I, I think at this point, based on what I've seen and how the parents act and based on Mary Feldman's um, comments, um, I know that she was also having a, a problem with this because we said, I pointed out that really the choice, and as Elizabeth said earlier today, the choice is between having a paraprofessional with you or being self-represented. It's not between having a paraprofessional with you or an attorney, especially in these cases. And this being sort of the first step to get in the door to get the right to appoint a counsel, I, um, I am going to make a motion that we allow for um, full in-court representation for these particular motions. Do we have to, is that a, we don't, because that's the committee's the default, call. You don't have to take it. Yeah. Someone would so have to I'm take. just saying that's what I would like to put forth for us. If you want to make another motion, I suppose to oppose that you can. Were you asking me? Yeah, I was asking you. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I wouldn't, I wouldn't limit that one. Now that I know that the blanket, uh, no in court representation has been rejected by the committee, I can work through, I don't have an issue with that. All right, great. Uh, moving to, let's take violence prevention next. That's a harder one for me. I want to open that up. Anybody have a different position than the full group's position? I do. If the if the trial was going to involve the testimony of expert witnesses, it should be that should be excluded from the in court representation. So if it's going to be testimony from medical doctors, where medical doctors have to be examined, or if there's mental health professionals that are being called for not for percipient testimony but for actual expert testimony. If there's going to be an expert brought in on uh, battered victims syndrome. Mm -hmm. So violence prevention obviously includes domestic violence, which could kids could be involved between the parties, but then also includes civil harassment, gun violence, restraining order, uh, the types of cases where there are no kids between the parties. Since we're going to go into family law next, I was just wondering, Steve, um, does that impact what you just say? Are you talking about expert? Yeah, I think that's type? my right line. If you're gonna, if you're gonna be cross-examining an expert witness, or and which means you should probably be taking their deposition before you cross-examine them, because mm -hmm. you know the rule, you're not supposed to ask a question on cross if you don't already know the answer. I think that goes beyond the scope of what we're including in the educational and training aspects of the paraprofessional program. Okay. Um, Sharon, you have your hand up. Yeah, just to just to clarify, um, as part of this, we are talking about restraining order hearings where maybe maybe there's not a permanent family court case where there are children involved and it's contested. So are we contemplating having paraprofessionals represent in that scenario, contested case um, where, you know, coming out of this, there may be permanent, um, not permanent, but orders regarding visitation, um, et cetera. Yeah, there could be, and there could be support orders too. Yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna object to that. Like I'm gonna, yeah, put on the record that I don't, I think that this is exceeding the scope of what we contemplated for paraprofessionals. I think the domestic violence case, the dynamics are different. I'm looking at different, um, type of violence. Um, and I think that there are different expertise is required for lawyers too. I think Sharon mentioned that not all lawyers are even qualified to do that. They're gonna have trauma-informed training. And I know that our paraprofessional is gonna be uh, trained in that. 
Um, I just think it's a different type of situation with domestic violence, We're just totally looking at different reasons for the violence uh, than civil harassment, let's say, like a dispute between neighbors or business partners or something like that. It's totally different. So I, I just, I'm thinking we, we want to, we may want to separate the type of um, violence prevention order we're talking about. What do you guys think about that? Sharon, is your hand up again or was that from before? Sorry, that was just oh, from before. Okay. Does anyone? Rita, yeah. you're, you're, you're saying that we should separate um, DVROs from GVROs, gun violence orders, and or civil harassment orders within this uh, subcategory? I'm asking, I'm putting it out there for discussion. What do you guys think about that? I will admit that one of the things that has caused me to change my views about in-court representation over the course of these many months is that every judicial officer save one, I think, said that they wanted the paraprofessional to be able to provide in-court representation. And that is extremely compelling to me because who am I to tell a judicial officer how to run their courtroom? And I'm wondering if Judge Wiley would be willing to share her thoughts about that. Well, I, I think from the beginning, I, I, I think I've been fairly clear in terms of what I view uh, as a judicial role vis-a-vis um, -vis anything that comes up before us, whether it's a hearing uh, or a trial. And, and we really are, um, to perform a very neutral task of being the trier of fact. And that requires that we have information if we are a trier of fact, particularly in family law cases. So it all falls on the judge to make all of these decisions. And we have very little time to do it. We have generally very little information. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, advocacy is, you know, there, there's sometimes I think it's a distinction um, without a difference in terms of how we are receiving that information. Um, I have seen some fantastic self-represented litigants present their cases, and I have seen some absolutely terrible attorneys present cases. Um, so from my perspective, um, the more information you provide to the judicial officer, the better their decisions are going to be. Um, and however we receive that information, whether, whether it's from the self-represented litigant, the paraprofessional, the attorney, to me, it doesn't matter. I think, you know, it, it, it's it, it, there, again, it's all information. I'm going to take that information and apply it to the law as I interpret it. So, you know, I listen to sometimes to the uh, discussions that we're having and I, and I think of what I do every day. And I think the practical reality for me um, is that I, I, want anyone who has any information that I think is relevant and will help me make a better decision to tell me what that information is. Um, and I do not believe that we should stand on um, the fact that someone may or may not have gone to law school, may or may not have passed the bar, um, because when you're looking at people's real world situations and, and what affects their lives and impacts their lives on a daily basis, they don't have the luxury to rely on uh, I think some of the technical issues that we're discussing here. So from that perspective, again, I'm, I'm very supportive of paraprofessionals who I have every faith will be um, educated, trained, licensed, and regulated uh, to come into any department that I sit in. And if I believe that they have some information that I may need, asking them for that information, expecting them as you know, an officer of the court um, to tell me that information in a truthful and accurate manner that will help me make a decision. Shara? I, I have so much respect for all the judges um, who are serving on this working group. Um, actually, all the judges I've ever worked with, I have so much respect. You have such a difficult job. Um, but I think that you have a certain vantage point um, that may be, you know, a little bit different from mine um, coming from, from the legal aid sector where we see cases that are botched up, sometimes not intentionally. Fariba, I, like I'm sure you see that too when paperwork bounces back. Um, what we're talking about is really a step above just paperwork. Um, and that is something that 
people go to law school for? Um, should there even be like more education on this? Like beyond law school? Probably yes, because attorneys get it wrong too. I'm not gonna say that att attorneys are the answer, um, but we see it when it goes wrong. And um, you know, as far as the access to justice um, issue, this is an access to justice issue, but you know, if I had a heart problem and I didn't have access to a heart surgeon, um, a nurse practitioner would not perform heart surgery on me either. So, um, I mean, I, I, this is where I just see things a little differently. I would agree in a lot of these areas um, to have paraprofessionals come up the, to the table and to be able to clarify things to the court because I think that that can be a service. But if we're talking about um, the ability to put on a trial, I just think that this is outside of the limited education that we are proposing. And it, it is limited because we want something to be able to stand up. And we saw what happened in Washington and given the discussions that we've had on that front on education and um, what it takes to be licensed, I don't think that that is enough to make a paraprofessional competent to put on a trial. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my opinion. Thank you. Anyone else? And I just wanna respond just briefly because I, oh, certainly, sure. I yeah. certainly appreciate that. And I think we need to be very clear on our choices and, and what our choices are that we're making and what the choices are going to be for, for people who will either walk into court by themselves with whatever limited background, education, training and experience that they have, or having someone who has a more training background, education experience, who will be able to advocate for them. Because if that's the choice, I wouldn't want a nurse practitioner to perform surgery on me either. But if it's a nurse practitioner who's watched a heart surgeon perform that surgery versus sitting on an operating table and dying, I might have to roll the dice with the nurse practitioner. And that's, I mean, that's really what we're looking at here. Those are the choices that, that a lot of these people that, that are in front of us have. Oh, Sharon, go ahead. Did you have a comment, Sharon, or was that your hand from before? Yeah. I, and I, I just think that, um, yeah, and I totally get judges need information. I've, I've watched it and I know how people, how it clogs up the system, the calendar, I get it. Um, I, I just can't bring myself to, uh, giving these folks false hope that you can pay a paraprofessional to conduct a trial when they're not gonna be trained as a lawyer. Uh, again, these folks are not going to law school. There's a limited lifetime. I'm on the regulations committee and we, it just keeps coming up in our conversation. This is a limited license. And we're making it only limited as to issues. Yeah, they cannot represent someone in a contract dispute, okay. But within the areas of law that we're allowing them to function, they're basically given carte blanche to do everything, including in court representation. I can't um, bring myself to creating that sense out there that, yeah, you, uh, you can pay this person to represent you in court um, where they can't probably are not going to be able to do as good a job as an attorney does versus you representing yourself. You represent yourself, you don't pay yourself. At least you're not you know, wasting your money. Um, and I don't want us to create a program where we are sort of creating that sort of sense um, that they could rely on. I think it's, it's just not, um, I don't want to create that system. I don't want to add that to this license. You know, something we haven't talked about is if we create a profession that theoretically is going to charge a lower fee, someone could make the conscious decision to go with the paraprofessional, even if they could afford attorneys. I get this all the time with engineers who decide they want to do their own divorce and they're going on the internet and they're Googling MSAs. And, you know, I actually had a guy come and consult with me. I said, this isn't going to work. You really need to do it this way. And I remember seeing him in a court three years ago when the wife was successfully setting aside his judgment that he had obtained by going through Google, you know, 
online forums. I, I'm, my feeling is that there will be those that are not hiring paraprofessionals because they can't hire an attorney. They're going to make a cost decision. And we're, there are certain areas, like when we get into the, the family law issues, I've got some specific areas where I think the paraprofessionals should not be doing in-court representation. I think that there's areas within the category that we're talking about where there should not be in-court representation. Like I said, with the anytime there's going to be expert witness testimony. So I, I think that there's a reason to limit the in-court representation to things that we can successfully train somebody and educate somebody to do within the one year time period that we're contemplating is collectively between the education and between the, the practical training where it's going to take a year to become a paraprofessional and not all of the applicants are going to be uh, law students who chose not to become lawyers. And, and am I correct that we have already carved out jury trials as something that is, that is not Okay, everyone's nodding good. Okay, so we're really just talking about bench trials at this point in time? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. all of these are bench trials. I, I don't know about the the gun violence or civil harassment if you've got a right to a jury trial, but everything else is it's all bench trials. Right. Right. So, uh, Sharon, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just, um, why can't we put it on the table um, to explore some of these in-court representation issues once we have more data. Maybe that's like a 2.0 where we can look at the data um, and then decide what happens. Like I understand that we all want access to justice and a lot of us are coming into this like very, very zealously, but is there any reason why we can't be a little bit more conservative when it comes to these issues of in-court representation and build that into um, a decision that make that we make like at a later point, uh, and maybe maybe the track for this involves um, paraprofessionals who have already been licensed, have been doing this successfully, and maybe they get additional education um, to be able to do in court representation if that's something that we approve down the road. Now you know that that will just have to be for our group that the full committee voted for in court representation. So you're saying for the family group that there would be a 1.0 with no, in, well, with limited in court representation, a 2.0 with full in court representation. I just, I think that these cases are different than other cases that we're talking about. And there's just so much at stake. We're talking about the custody of someone's children. Um, and I, I don't mind going more conservatively. This just um, has alarm bells ringing all over for me. Yeah, same here. Um, I think that I want us to kind of regroup here. Uh, we are in the violence prevention um, topic, uh, which includes DV, civil harassment, gun violence, workplace violence. I'm not sure if it's worth our time to kind of take them uh, type by type, such as civil harassment. For example, I'm comfortable with full in court representation for civil harassment. The average civil harassment, in my experience, now, of course, I haven't seen every case, but it's mostly, um, there's, there's no kids, obviously, there's no kids involved. The type of violence is different. Uh, this may be, maybe neighbors, but a lot of times there are people who will not see each other again. They're, um, and even in our court, and I know a lot of courts um, allow for uh, dispute resolution in these cases when the violence is not egregious. Um, and I wonder if anyone, uh, people have comments that, um, especially Steve and Sharon, who I think the three of us are kind of a different position than the rest. We want to deviate. Yeah, I, I'm, again, I'm starting from the point of where I, I've accepted, we lost, what was it, 13 to four, Sharon? on the in-court representation about with the working group as a whole. Mm -hmm. There are areas within domestic abuse where I do feel strongly that someone needs to be at all cost encouraged to have an attorney representing them. So the, the area that I'm specifically interested in is the when there is going to be expert testimony. Okay. Um, if expert witness, again, not percipient because there's, there's a difference there, but if there's gonna be the other side is represented by an attorney and they're hiring um, 
expert witnesses on the in the again the area of, of battered victim syndrome or um, PTSD, and and it's not somebody that's treated the protected party. It's someone that who has analyzed their records. I think the paraprofessional has to be referring that out to an attorney to bring in expert testimony and to take a deposition of that expert witness. Okay, I'm not, again, I just wanna make sure I understand which, are you talking about every single type or just the domestic violence? I, I'm limiting it to domestic violence right now based on your request. Okay, and I actually like um, your idea and I think it may apply to all of them. You know, gun violence is a new animal, I mean, kind of brand new legislation if you think about it, but from 2014, so it's not that, uh, it's not relatively recent and it keeps being changed every year, um, as you know from your experience on Flexcom. And workplace violence could be complicated. A lot of times attorneys do those because companies come in with their attorneys, but some mom and pop stores may, you know, want to hire a power professional or what have you. So I think I would, um, support that for all types when an expert has to come in. Sharon? Um, yeah, also just a reminder that um, in cases of sexual assault where the perpetrator is not a family member, mm -hmm. um, that would be a civil harassment restraining order. Um, and like, I think that we need to consider those cases as well. Right. And uh, a lot of times the, the criminal court usually issues the CPO. So, um, uh, so yeah, but not I, always, not always. Oh, okay. Okay. Again, I haven't seen every case. Anybody else want to talk about this? I know that Steve, Sharon and I have been talking about this, but I want to make sure I hear everyone. Okay. So I think that um, it's, a safe, it's safe to guess that uh, Sharon, Steve and I, um, we have the position that if there's expert testimony in any violence prevention, case that um, the paraprofessional be limited to uh, the support person answering procedural questions from the court? Sharon, Steve, do I say, is that accurate? Yes? Uh, yeah, I'm a little, I, the, can you state that one more time? So question. if there's expert testimony, then the role of the paraprofessional should be limited to in-court support person answering the direct procedural questions from the judge. Yes. Okay. So Lynn, um, yes. Oh, I think that, yeah, for me, I, I'm definitely not trying to relitigate re what um, was voted on in the larger group, but uh, um, you know, in areas where that we're looking at where I think that it's not appropriate for paraprofessionals to represent. Um, that's where I'm gonna like speak up. And here, I think my view is just a little bit more expansive. It's not just cases where there's expert testimony, but I would say in any contested um, DPRO that okay. paraprofessionals be allowed to act as a support person, mm -hmm. but not mm -hmm. um, represent in court otherwise. That was my next actually comment that I want to separate separate out DV to make it even more restrictive that in any domestic violence restraining order, then the representation be limited to uh, in-court support person, whether there are any experts or not. I would let agree know. with that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, let me know if I'm if I'm straying off topic. Um, but so basically, just to recap what you said. Um, so basically, with cases with gun violence, civil harassment, and workplace violence, that um, if there comes a need for expert testimony, then that the paraprofessional has to kind of take a step back. What would be the triggering event? Is it an exchange of a notice of expert depositions or? Um, designation of experts like that notice that has to be circulated like there has to be I feel like a clear cut of when that trigger is met um, maybe it's that. right if unfortunately there can be there are so many cases in family law where I'm not getting demands for expert witnesses from the other counsel in cases where I should so there's a situation where you may not know about an expert witness until you exchange witness lists 
which could be a week before trial. Mm -hmm. And then also if once that trigger is met, let's say that it's as simple as there is a circulation of the notice of designation of experts or something, um, you know, what is the paraprofessional's responsibility? Is it to refer it to an attorney? And now there's an attorney coming in alongside with the paraprofessional. So that's just some things that will have to be considered. I think if we're limiting it, we have to find at what point, you know, what triggers and then what are the consequences of that? It's just, again, yeah. just thinking outside. And there's not this, go ahead, sorry. I was gonna say that's a, a, oh, sorry. Oh. Who's talking? I was, my apologies. I, I was gonna oh, say that's, okay. a great, that's a great point because it, you know, you, you can run into the situation where someone then discloses an expert uh, with no intent to call the expert just to get the paraprofessional knocked out of the case, which even if the court does say, okay, now the litigant needs to find a new attorney, that's going to further delay whatever the, the proceeding is. And in family law, uh, as you and I both know, Mr. Hamilton, sometimes attorneys use certain procedural issues to delay uh, for whatever purpose, um, the hearing and or trial date. So we have to be very careful um, if we're going to have these triggers such that it, it can't be weaponized uh, against the litigant who does not have uh, the money for an attorney, now loses their prayer professional and are at a decided disadvantage uh, once the hearing and or trial takes place. So let me make sure I understand you correctly because I don't litigate. So you're saying that sometimes attorneys can designate an uh, expert, but never call the expert? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, that's a good point because I can see an abuser furthering their abuse using this like as litigation abuse. I could totally see that. How do we handle that? I don't litigate, so you, Steve? <laughs> well, I, I would say that, that a bench officer who at trial sees that a paraprofessional was disqualified through using expert witness discovery, and then that expert witness was never called at trial, could sua sponte issue some 271 sanctions. I mean, I'm sure, I, I think that there, there would be consequ easily imposed consequences on someone who did it for tactical reasons to delay or stall. I think that that's I think that that's a good option uh, that the court does have, but that doesn't necessarily address the issue of you know the the actual delay. So you know maybe someone is out of their home for longer, maybe they haven't seen their children for longer. You know, I mean, there there are all of these more practical um, issues that 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 may create. Mm -hmm. And I would say, oh, sorry, go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead, Steve. I would say anecdotally, where I where I would see that the experts more frequently is not on behalf of the um, protected party, but the restrained party. Trying that's where I'm I'm kind of seeing this envisioning this scenario where the restrained party lawyers up, the lawyer knows to get expert witnesses involved and goes through all these things to try and undermine the protected party's argument. Yeah. While you're thinking, I just want to say in the rules committee, we are sort of looking at successive representation and fee sharing and things like that. I'm kind of thinking that, um, you know, the paraprofessional, would, of course, depends on what the rules end up being, but the paraprofessional could be, uh, you know, kind of farm that piece out to an attorney. Um, Yeah, and not cause too much delay. Yeah, because you could do it where the attorney's just sitting at, the, the attorney's handling only the examination or cross-examination of the expert witnesses mm -hmm. and not necessarily the lay witnesses. But there is some delay I can see because right. even though I don't litigate, I'm assuming you need time to get ready, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's a delay right there. And the court's backlog could mean that the court cannot set it as quickly as um, one would want to avoid prejudicing the other side, right? And, and, I, and, I, and I do want to stress that, you know, the number of expert witnesses you see in a DVRO um, is, is de minimis, uh, at least from, from, from my practice here in San Francisco. You just usually don't see a lot of expert witnesses in, in these trials. Mm -hmm. 
Or our, yeah, our stats are over 90% on our DD dedicated calendars, uh, SRLs. They don't call experts. So. And that's what I was going to say that um, cases that maybe rise to the level of experts. Um, is maybe the paraprofessional won't be there because it usually sometimes involves a lot of money or involves um, more complicated issues where maybe a paraprofessional was not um, brought in at that point. So this might be a mood issue, but it still highlighted the fact that um, when we do create certain carve outs, we got to find those trigger points. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. And the fact that there are not that many cases that will fall under this exception, maybe it's okay to have the, the limitation. Judge, what do you think conceptually? I understand that there could be manipulations of the role for tactical reasons, but conceptually, do you do you agree with me that this is when we are getting to expert testimony? I mean, the mere fact that you hire an expert witness, unless they're volunteering their services, usually means that there's sufficient means to hire attorneys too. Conceptually, do you, are you comfortable with the idea of a paraprofessional cross-examining an expert witness? It depends on the paraprofessional, and it, it certainly also depends on the expert witness. Um, the, you know, I, I again, I, I am of the of the mindset that nothing that happens in front of me is rocket science, or I should say, maybe very few things that happen in front of me are rocket science, um, and are are of such complexity. And and I would like to think that if a paraprofessional took a case that maybe initially did not have that complexity, but then they discovered that there was complexity, they would tell their client. I cannot handle this. Um, you have, you know, maybe you have too many assets. Uh, maybe, you know, it's a long-term marriage. Uh, there are experts, a forensics expert, a business valuation expert. There are all these different things that, that need to happen. Um, and so I'm simply not qualified to do that. I think that that's the more likely scenario than it is to have a paraprofessional then walk into court with a very complicated uh, case or situation and, and, and try to you know, navigate their way through that. Because one, and I, and I don't know, I haven't been privy to the other discussions that we're having with respect to regulation and licensing, but something of that nature, I would, I would imagine um, particularly the court uh, would have recourse on if, if that were to happen. Um, if, I see a, if I see a paraprofessional who was in front of me and was ill-equipped to handle that situation, I think that's a conversation that the court then needs to have with the with you know with the paraprofessional with the other attorney and you know maybe there's a continuance of a trial date that needs to happen. So that's I mean, but again, I think that this particular issue in, in my experience is not going to be one that's going to, in the vast majority of the cases. These are not the vast majority of the cases that we're dealing with. If that disclosure that you've just described was made mandatory that upon the identification or designation or request for designation of expert witnesses, a paraprofessional was required to advise their client in writing that they need to consult with an attorney, I, that might be an easier solution to this. And we are um, in the rules committee, we are working on rules of professional responsibility and you know acting competently. Obviously, it's going to be if I know that's part of it, if I know yeah. that, that it, and not just advice, but make may come sign off on it too. Yeah, there, that there's a but mandatory like form it. that needs to be signed and submitted. I agree. Yeah. That 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 takes care of my primary concern. Okay. Is and the regulation the let the, the, we always want to think we're going to have the most scrupulous um, paraprofessional, just like we want to have the most scrupulous attorneys. But just like I know there's attorneys I don't trust, there would be paraprofessionals I wouldn't trust that wouldn't necessarily be that forthright with their clients unless it was mandated. Okay. So that takes care of your concern with regards to experts. Yes, it does. But what about the carve out of domestic violence that we talked about, the misdemeanor cases involving, especially involving children? Now, um, you know, uh, because DV would, we have different calendars, DV with minors, DV without minors. So that could be another way we sort of split that and put DV with no minors along with civil harassment, workplace violence, gun violence, and then only if, look at cases with kids. If the paraprofessional is gonna be able to appear in court and providing court representation on child custody and visitation issues out in just a normal dissolution or parentage action, 
then there shouldn't be a carve out for DV. I think that's kind of a- We haven't talked about that yet. I know, that's what I'm thinking. Is, <laughs> I think that's gotta be kind of across the board. That's the problem because it's, I, I was very clear with everybody when we were developing original guidelines, I was doing it with the assumption formulated by some of the initial conversations of the group and whole that there wasn't gonna be in court representation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what- Well, in the custody visitation right now, if you have a, um, a, a parent who, who is putting children at risk, you know, emergency uh, screening issues, you know, drug use, child abuse, et cetera, um it's so tough it's like you know, you know i i want to say well if there's allegations of abuse whether it's physical sexual domestic abuse it shouldn't be a paraprofessional that's doing it it should be an attorney but we may then be denying a person any assistance because they can't afford a lawyer mm -hmm. and they could afford a paraprofessional this is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so we can move into family because now we're looking at all you know long list of issues here right we're talking about custody <laughs> decision child support spousal support all the issues that we included we don't have that list up but um we're looking at enforcement we're looking before you move to family can i just i just want to make sure i have clarity on where we are with domestic violence well, we're not we don't because um the crossover, okay. the domestic violence piece, the crossover with custody visitation issues. But what about the other uh, violence prevention? So besides domestic violence, is there agreement that it's going to be full in court representation in everything except for domestic violence, which is yet to be decided? I believe so. I didn't hear anyone who wanted to deviate as to other types of violence prevention cases. All right. Yeah, I, 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 now. I would want something put into the memo that specifically states based on uh, a requirement that in the event expert witnesses are, uh, are I'm sorry, I forget the word. It's based on a requirement that a client sign an informed written consent in the event expert witness testimony is going to be introduced. Okay, hang on a minute. Hang on. <laughs> we had the discussion about informed consent in the rules committee, and that's a that's a that's a specific that's a term of art. There is a there is a definition of what informed consent is in the rules of professional conduct, and that's whenever something is prohibited, like let's say in a case where the paraprofessional has a conflict of interest, but the client can waive a conflict of interest by signing an informed consent. Business transaction is another one. Amos had a complete list. Um, so again, that's the way the rules are designed. If, it, if, if something is prohibited, then the client can sign an informed consent to waive it. Is this that kind of thing? So this could be structured as um, it's prohibited for a paraprofessional to, um, um, I don't know what the language would be, to cross-examine an expert witness, introduce an expert witness, unless the client has uh, consented via an affirmative written informed consent. So it would be prohibited conduct unless there was informed consent. That works. Thanks that so works. Much. Sounds really good. Judge yeah. Wiley, what do you think about that? Ooh, thumbs up. I like That's it. Great. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Leah. Okay. Oh, Sharon has her hand. Oh, I just wanted to um, let everyone know that I have to leave for about a half an hour and five minutes, um, but I'll be back. I That's didn't want to be it to family that. law. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry, it's a meeting I can't avoid. Okay, we'll see you shortly. Did she say half an hour? Did you say half an hour? Yeah, I'll leave um, in about five minutes and then I'll be back around 3.10. Okay, maybe we'll take a quick break also. Um, okay, so I think what, I think, um, I think we're done with the violence prevention topic, yeah? 
I, I thought we didn't decide on DV. I, I think DV's decided except for we're going to deal with in matters of matters involving child custody and visitation as part of the global discussion of child custody and visitation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It should be a uniform rule, I would think. Okay. Okay, could we go into family? And I was wondering, Linda, if you have access to the old included, yes. excluded list. I do. Let me. I think that may be helpful in our discussion. Let me bring that up. Okay. And then I want us to think about maybe the approaches for which task do we want to deviate? Okay. Can you see that now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me go back to the top to family law. Okay. Okay. All right. So for anything that's included, Speak up if you want to deviate in any way from the full group's position. Okay. Let me know yeah. when you want me to scroll down. I, I don't for any is any Sharon and Steve or or also the other members. <laughs> I don't mean to leave you out. Sorry. <laughs> my lack of my lack of suggesting an alternative is based on the, the working group's vote as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I know this group's vote I asked for at the beginning of our meeting today. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to suggest any deviations from those because we've excluded the in court representation aspect, doesn't change what I suggested for dissolution, paternity, mm -hmm. summary dissolutions, or petitions for custody and support. Okay, I'm, I'm there with you. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that. <laughs> so I asked what's on the screen. Wait, 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 one person at a time. Sorry. sorry. I'm not requesting any deviation from the working group's general recommendation. Okay. As to what's on the screen or as to the whole list? As to what's on the screen. Okay. Okay, let's move down. Okay, so I think that, um, for custody and visitation, um, my concern is with um, at-risk situations. When a parent is putting the child at risk, when it doesn't rise to the level of juvenile dependency being involved. So maybe we should make that distinction in writing um, and deal with it separately? For in court representation issue. Yeah. Right. That's what I'm suggesting. Um, or I'm actually putting it out there. I, I can change my mind. I don't mind being convinced, but I just put it out there. It's been on my mind. Anybody want to comment? Steve, why don't we start with you because you're the next person on my screen? <laughs> Sorry, Freebomb, I'm struggling. That's okay, that's okay. I think that it's worth the time. The thing is that, um, I mean, in our court at least, the court's expert is usually at family court services. I mean, the screener works for family court services and they start carting around and, and uh, calling teachers on an emergency basis, trying to find out what's the best thing to do here. Um, does it involve, and if comes out with the recommendation, parents don't agree, then you've got a hearing. And should the paraprofessional be authorized to make those legal arguments? I'm coming back to the question of whether I believe that a paraprofessional should be arguing a child custody and visitation issue in any circumstance in family court. So I think that's why it's important to separate it. I think maybe that's a good way. 
um, so we can tackle it individually. Uh, my reason for saying is because I would have no problem saying that the paraprofessional can represent um, a self, you know, in pro per because the, right now the, what's happening is they're doing it on their own. They, um, they ask for custody visitation. They fill out an RFO to have the court make the, the final decision. That's why they're in court. Then um, the court schedules a mediation through the Family Court Services Program who will meet with both parents and if appropriate, meet with the child. And um, then that, like you mentioned, that mediator, that mediator recommendation report will be circulated. Everyone have, will have the opportunity to review it. And um, there will be a court hearing based off of it. So a lot of it, of the action is being done by the court system itself. Um, and the parties are involved. Right now, attorneys are not allowed to go into the mediation room. That, I, that's my understanding. So the paraprofessional would not be either. So the paraprofessional's role would be making sure that um, the person has the right exhibits attached to that RFO, re the request for order, and um, provide that kind of guidance. In a, in a case like just a regular dissolution, um, sometimes the parents are arguing because they just can't stand each other and they wanna drag the kids through the mud. Not that they want to, but that's what happens. Um, and it usually sometimes just takes that one court hearing and everything's resolved. Um, that's why I don't see any problem with having a paraprofessional help throughout all the stages. Yes, when it's at risk youth, there's abuse, things like that, then I think we should deal with that separately and, and really carve out the role of the paraprofessional. Um, but as far as the prior, I don't see why we would limit it to something. Um, Stephen, what are your thoughts on that? I'm struggling. I, I, can, I can see a scenario where there should be paraprofessionals available because otherwise someone's going to be foundering in court on, floundering in court on their own. I can, but I could also see situations where people are convinced or believe that they're better off having a paraprofessional instead of attorney and all of the appropriate factors under Family Code 30, Section 3011 aren't introduced and we get a custody order in place that isn't really in the best interest of the children because there wasn't two attorneys involved in the case. And Just, it, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I interrupted you, Steve, go ahead. And, and, and that's where I would hope that the judge then steps in and develops whatever record that they need to, to make the appropriate decision. Because, yeah, I mean, I understand a lot of the focus is on the attorneys and the paraprofessionals, but ultimately, you know, it's the court's responsibility to make sure that the process uh, is fair and happens as intended. So if there's, there is information that, that the judge does not have, but may be available uh, during the hearing or the trial, then certainly I think it's the judge's responsibility to make sure that uh, that information uh, is somehow elicited. And so just to be sorry, Elizabeth, just to be clear, I was had not gotten to a regular RFO yet. I was just talking about a an emergency request where a child is at risk. I, I wanted to just for the record agree that on, in a regular run the mail RFO, yeah, at the first hearing, usually status quo, um, either there are existing orders that are continued or status quo is put in an order and then they're sent to mediation. The and attorneys are not allowed in mediation, so paraprofessionals won't be allowed. And it'll, it'll you know, kind of follow a route. And if the parents just ultimately don't agree, they end up in trial. And uh, that's a whole, that's a different discussion. I was talking about the very out, outset of an emergency request where it's an emergency screening where attorneys all are allowed actually and that order that comes out of that it's key and sometimes stays in place so if a parent is represented by a paraprofessional and the paraprofessional cannot make it and the parents um their recommendations for that parent have no visitation or very restricted visitation because of the findings of a screener and the paraprofessional does not have the required expertise to argue it and that parent ends up with that very restrictive order and what we've seen is just going to continue in place, sometimes for a while. Uh, then that parent is, you know, prejudiced because um, 
uh, you know, they had a professional represent them. And yes, I mean, Judge Wiley, I understand that the judge makes an ultimate call, but it, I, I just think that the judge cannot advocate for people, you know, and if the paraprofessional doesn't pull out the right legal arguments to persuade the judge to change the recommendations of the screener in whole or in part, then again, I'm worried about that situation. I'm putting it out there for consideration, that's all. And that screener is the expert. And then everybody they talk to are, I don't litigate. So I'm assuming that the, if, I'm, if I'm the attorney for the person who disagrees with the recommendation, I'd like to get all those people in. As any, Elizabeth, I'm sorry, I interrupted you earlier. You wanna continue? No, thanks for clarifying. Um, so you're saying um, for like, let's say for example, there's a TRO, what would be like one, scenario like one person is um not giving the child back during their visitation or what are certain um situations or scenarios that you envision would require um paraprofessional if you can just elaborate for those that like you well maybe you can because you mentioned you don't do um no no uh, we see it all the time that. in our office you know we have 40 44 000 people last year we see it all the time so parent um child comes home from a visit uh, saying to mom yeah dad was drunk you know, or, or um, uh, mom, um, I don't know, um, finds out that is using drugs or, or anything like that. Um, and this is, does, is not substantiated to a level that CPS gets involved and juvenile dependency court gets involved, but it's still, it's a he says, she says situation, but still enough to be litigated in family court. I'm sure you've seen it, you know? Yeah. Allegations of child abuse, drug abuse, you yeah. sure allegations of um, you know kidnap parental kidnap or actual removal of the child from the county, but that you know whether it puts the child in danger or not, that kind of a side issue. But now I'm more talking about drug use, child abuse allegations. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify for the people who are attending who don't have the benefit of our um, legal experience, um, sure. but who might even be in a position and need a paraprofessional in the future. I mean, I don't yeah. have to myself from that. Yeah. And the other one being like uh, for a, the restrained parent um, who um, were 30, 44 rebuttable presumption that joint, our joint custody applies and they want to rebut. I mean, those are complicated issues. And if the professional does a really good job to rebut, then that parent's right remain restricted. These are kind of the scenarios I've been thinking about. So special carved out circumstances. And yeah. And when you say 3044, family code 3044, are you referring to like when one person can ask for sole custody based on the fact that there is domestic abuse in the relationship? Yes, when there is a finding of domestic violence, the court is prohibited from awarding joint custody to the um, perpetrator. It's a rebuttable presumption and it can be rebutted by showing certain factors as stated in the code. And if they're not done, in, they don't do a good job, they don't rebut. Okay. So their well, rights I are restrict, continue to be restricted. So I kind of go back to the whole thing where if you were giving um, the legal paraprofessional the ability to give legal advice outside of the courtroom, less actions will be in the courthouse. Um, that they will be able to get their access to justice outside the courtroom by um, being able to come up with stipulations or assisting the individual, the parent who has concerns about the child safety to seek other avenues other than taking everything to court, such as calling CPS, gathering exhibits, um, or in situations where the other person was drunk, um, you know, and also getting certain stipulations where they say, you know what, these are going to be the rules. When you have the children at this time, you know, Johnny told me that you were drunk and he didn't feel safe. And so then there's communications that are being had. Um, so that's why I think there'll be less court things. Yeah, that's my thinking on it. 
there's no prohibition right now for that right now. I mean, if, uh, if somebody hires a paralegal, I think there's a prohibition that the par paralegal is not allowed to do those things, but it's just, it doesn't happen. I mean, people, those pe people in those situations are not functional enough to agree. You know, they end up in court and yeah, in court, um, there can be negotiations or certain things parties can agree to. No, I 100% I agree that paraprofessionals can play a big role in encouraging stipulations and keeping cases outside of um, courtrooms and reduce litigations. But I'm not talking about those cases. I'm just talking about these other cases where we, got, we have to have a judge make a call. Judge Wiley, I wonder, uh, do you see a problem with that? When you say a problem with that? With, uh, you know, in these circumstances where the child is um, in danger and the, the paraprofessional doesn't um, necessarily have the, you know, the training to argue those cases and protect a, either child safety or by getting the right orders or, um, you know, um, uh, protect the parents' rights to have a contact with their child when they should. I'm, I'm, I'm a little less concerned with that, I think, um, simply because, you know, depending on what the nature of the allegations are, um, there may be some CPS involvement um, that the judge will have access to. Uh, that information. Um, there may be police reports uh, that, that, again, would document uh, medical records, things of that nature that, you know, if you have someone who is aware of the facts and maybe they haven't, you know, the paraprofessional hasn't requested that information, at least that person uh, is informing the court that there may be additional information that, that may be out there. Um, so I, I, again, I'm, I'm less concerned um, with that because I, I think the paraprofessional can play such an, an invaluable role just in terms of, you know, providing the court with uh, the factual circumstances, a chronology, and what information there may be out there that a litigant may not be able to. Um, and so I think that um, from my perspective, that the paraprofessional um, at a minimum would be able to inform the court of information, again, that the court may not have. And so on balance, I think that is more critical in my, from my perspective in terms of what the court may need to know in order to make uh, those decisions. Um, concerning legal arguments and advocacy, um, you know, again, there's such a wide range in what we see now um, that it certainly can't be, you know, it, it'll certainly fall somewhere within that range. Is the education company including evidence, evidence, of course, on evidence? Do we know? Absolutely. Okay. Actually, there's there's actually two different courses on evidence. Only one one can be weighed based on what you did as part of your underlying education, whether it be a law school or in paralegal school. Okay. The judge reminded me of that when she talked about police reports. So I'm just wondering if they're gonna learn into object okay you know uh, i'm not i think we're hovering a little bit um do we have uh, at this point do we have anyone who wants to deviate on the issue of custody visitation and we can divide it we can divide it into emergency screening type issues versus non-emergencies is there any support for differentiating between temporary custody orders and permanent custody orders. In other words, paraprofessionals can appear at court on temporary orders, but if it's trial and it's the permanent custody orders that they're not allowed to make in court uh, appearances. And just to say it, in our court, stats are very low on those cases. Most cases I wanna say about 80%, 85% settled and they don't go to trial. They're just tiny motions, tiny hearings, you know. So we're talking about carving out very small number of cases, relatively. Anybody for that? Sharon had my back on this one, but she's gone. But she's gone. It, 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 
nobody else, if nobody else that's on this committee is supportive of that position, we can move on. I think a full, because again, I don't litigate a full fledged custody trial, not involving an emergency. Um, I'm not so concerned about. I, I, I was mostly concerned about emergencies, emergency okay. uh, issues and protecting children's safety and protecting parents' um, contact with their children. If, um, if, uh, if, if, the, um, if the case is not litigated well on their behalf as well. That's Marisa, what I, mean. I just want to ask, um, don't these kind of accusations come up very frequently? Like, um, isn't it common to say like, oh, um, dad's new girlfriend slapped the kid or somebody, whatever it is, I feel like it's pretty common. So trying to carve that out seems challenging. And then right now, the vast majority of these cases are, both parties are, they're self-represented doing this back and forth. Mm -hmm. I guess well, it, I just it doesn't understand. end up always in an emergency screening because the judge will read the pleadings and decide there's not enough to substantiate an emergency order. And so I you so go with that. The, ex the exclusion you want to carve out is for the emergency hearing or a not even a hearing that aren't those emergency orders sometimes issued ex party i'm they talking about yeah they are but i'm talking about when it gets to the hearing when it's you know at lady at hearing i'm not okay. talking about at the outset yeah because i think our professionals actually can help a self-represent litigant um, do the paperwork really well help them with their declaration in terms of asking for emergency screens much better than um, they can themselves and for, in most cases, you know, just like we do, we help them out. I'm talking about the actual court hearing on the motion. Right. And, and, and I think, um, preventing the person who actually interacted with the litigant, prepared the paperwork, formalized the declaration, submitted the declaration, not to be then able to participate in that court hearing. Um, you know, again, in my mind is, that's a, situation where I, I think that we really should allow that person um, to participate in the hearing um, as much or as little as the, the court wants them to participate. I think that's a great point. Uh, what I was envisioning, of course, it all depends on what we come up with in the rules committee is that I'll, if that's the rule, then I think paraprofessionals will come up with, uh, will have to come up with sorts of um, business relationships uh, to allow for successive representation. So if they're allowed to fee share, they're allowed to own firms together, they're allowed to work together like that, I think there'll be successive representation or at least limited scope representation. Again, it all depends on what the rule committee comes out with, right? Um, and what ultimately the rules are for this new licensed professional. Um, uh, but I think that they'll just come up with a plan. That is, this part will be done by the paraprofessional, the client saves money the paperwork is prepared well and then if an emergency is um order is, is granted then the hearing at the hearing the attorney will do the work and there is a successive representation continuous consistent that's Fariba, what i had in mind fariba i completely agree with you i believe that that would be something similar in the workers compensation realm where basically um you have the attorney supervising the whole case, but they send in the representative to do all of the um, arguing and negotiations at the hearing and the attorney is not there. I can kind of see maybe a family law attorney um, giving the information to the paralegal and just uh, making sure since they're more familiar with the, um, the paperwork and the drafting um, that they're going in there based on, you know, consulting with an attorney and, and that I agree with you on that. And I just want to say a good paraprofessional, not the bad actors, okay? A good paraprofessional actually would want that. I mean, they don't want to go in and, and risk a child's safety because they don't know how to argue it. You see, I, I, I totally believe that. 
And since you bring up the word bad actor, I just wanted to clarify um, something that someone said previously and that I really, um, really spoke to me was the only reason bad actors exist is because there isn't something that's a regulated profession that allows them to do what they do. Because a lot of people, I believe, would rather come out of the dark. Because yes, do the bad actors exist? Yes, they'd rather come out of the dark and really help one and all. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. I agree. Okay. All right. So I'd like to move us on. I just want to, again, with the, all the discussion we've had, is, is there, um, I kind of like to put that in there because I think we should deviate and carve out emergencies. Um, and I want to put that in the memo that, uh, that uh, paraprofessionals should not be allowed to do in court representation when, and I'm trying to find the right wording here, where an emergency custody visitation, uh, at, a, at a hearing on an emergency custody visitation request where the TR temporary orders have been granted, temporary ex parte orders have been granted, which means that the judge found enough to issue those emergency orders. It's, do I have anyone's support on that? I'm not asking for a vote, I'm just wondering. <laughs> you can put my name in there. <laughs> Steve, what do you think about that? Are you still struggling? With the custody? Yeah, the, the proposal I just made I, for the memo. We don't have to have a vote. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think my concerns are gonna be alleviated and I'm just gonna have to wait to see what happens. In other words, I. I I can't bring myself to believe that it's going to be better for somebody to have a paraprofessional when they can afford an attorney. And I can't. So I, I'm just, I'm just going to, I will struggle in silence. How about that? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Put that in the memo. <laughs> uh -huh. And I wasn't sure Elizabeth, if you were for that or you just um, understood that that kind of successive representation could happen. Correct. I just wanted to make sure we discussed it so that even if later in the future something comes up, we're like, well, it was discussed, it was talked, it was considered. Um, I don't necessarily have the benefit of called disposition on this on the California Association of Legal Document Assistance. So um, I guess I'll definitely be more um, in a better position to state our position when um, the full meeting um, comes with all of the working group members. But thank you for the opportunity to speak on that. Okay, good, good, good. So let's so move on. Just from my understanding, uh -huh. the recommendation is this is the first deviation from the full working group's position, other than what we talked about with the guardianship and conservatorships. Right. Under family, that prior professionals would not be allowed to provide full in-court representation um, at a hearing on an emergency custody or visitation request when a judge has issued preliminary orders on the a request. Temporary. Temporary, temporary orders. Emergency orders temporary so and that's just um, me that's just me the others haven't don't have that position this is a dissenting view <laughs> and and but they would still be able to provide the responsive representation in that situation they just can't advocate no no that applies to both sides uh, the moving party and the responding party. No, no, that's not, that's not what I meant. I'm oh. sorry. When, when I'm referring to responsive representation, what I was talking about is sitting at council table and responding to direct inquiries. Oh, no, I'm mm -hmm. for that. They can come okay. in, they can solve it. They just can't litigate, make legal right. arguments. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, anything else on this screen where people want to debate? Um, I would like to change the spousal support language. I'm requesting that uh, temporary remain included, um, but that uh, permanent spousal support. So permanent spousal support in a short-term marriage, no issue. But if it's permanent spousal support in a long-term marriage, it should be excluded. It's already excluded. It's not, it, it's, it's excluded if it's a buyout. But uh, no, if you look at the new document, it says um, it says uh, spousal domestic partners support in a long term marriage in long term marriages. 
If, okay, that's inconsistent with what we had done before. As long as that's excluded, then I'm okay. Well, that was my understanding. That's This is the current version. What's up on the screen is the most recent version. Yeah, see, I don't think that. So I think it has to go back to what you you just had us. I don't think that the paraprofessionals should be doing 4320 trials. I see. So that's two, not three. So two should say permanent short-term marriages only. Yeah, permanent and short-term only, permanent support and long-term marriages, no. And then that eliminates the need to discuss number three. Okay, yes. so, and what we're moving towards now is rather than having an exhaustive list of everything that's included, uh -huh. we're just listing exclusions. So what would be the exclusion here? No, your exclusion is correct. Your, the language in the exclusion is correct. It was mm -hmm. says spousal or domestic partner support in long-term marriages. Right, Steve? That's it. No, what's on the screen? No, it's not. I think- Not was... on the screen. The new list, the new shorter version of what's in excluded. You want to put that up? It was in the PowerPoint, please. Okay, um, let's see. We have less than an hour left. I just want to make sure. I think we're on track to finish on time. Hold on a second. Sure. So, this. right there. That is exactly what I'm suggesting. Yeah. Okay. We're so good. this is what we're going to use in the language in the memo that these are the exclusions. Okay. Thank if you. that's the language that's used, then we're good and we can move on to the next subject area. Okay. So once she gets back that back on, then it was separate property, community property, quasi community property. Sorry, before we move on, um, I believe we talked about the um, as long as the parties were okay with waiving their in a marital settlement agreement, um, spousal support, um, does that language in the PowerPoint presentation, um, I just want to make sure we don't lose that because. Um, no, because that would be, we included it just for temporary support or for support in short term marriages, and that's still included. The exclusion only applies to long-term marriages and that's consistent with what both both documents. No, what Elizabeth is saying is what if the parties are agreeing to either waive or set spousal support in a long-term marriage? We Can excluded, I, yeah, I think my recollection is we, we excluded that specifically. So not, so not even in a, in a marital settlement agreement? Or Correct, that's where I think some of the greatest risk would come. Okay. That's um, not my recollection. I just want to uh, report my dissenting um, opinion to this. Um, we did discuss okay. it. And, yeah. Mm, Thank you. Would, uh, yeah, I don't think we we put any of this forward in the full group. So there's still time to add in a dissenting opinion. And I think what you're saying is that the bullet spousal or domestic partner support in, in long-term marriages uh, your position is to add except in a marital settlement agreement. Yes. So just so I'm, I'm clear, so if a paraprofessional working with an attorney enters into a marital settlement agreement that has a long-term either waiver of spousal support or setting of spousal support, what we're looking at right now would it prevent that paraprofessional from doing that. Is that accurate? What do you mean working with an attorney? You mean an attorney on the other side? Correct. Uh huh. If they're trying to reach an agreement and there's a marital settlement agreement, but it has a long-term spousal support component, um, are what we're doing, would that preclude the care professional from then working uh, on that document and or uh, advising the client uh, because we're saying you can't work on anything that uh, involves a long-term spousal support component? I, can we get the other, can you do a side-by-side -side on the Linda where you're, you've got the slides on one side and the other document? I think so. 
Let me yeah. see about doing that. Put them both. I, I won't be able to, the slideshow won't be able to be uh, like a full uh, slideshow. It'll have to be in this form. I, um, but let me do that. I, I can think show what it was. this. Yeah, I'm sorry. And I can make these each half screen. While Linda works on that, I just also wanted to clarify that um, what's happening now is um, when someone is wanting to waive their right, sometimes they do that in order to get um, maybe a bigger payout in the house or be able to keep the house so that they can have somewhere to live with the children. Um, so it, it is something that comes up and is commonly waived. Also, some people, um, they choose to go ahead and just do this so that um, they can, can, and they have to sign the marital settlement agreement saying that they understand the um, situation could change in their financial situation. And by signing here, um, they're waiving that right now and forever. So there's definitely waivers and disclosures in those agreements, which I'm sure you guys know, but I just wanted to give some background on that. Sorry. And I, you know, and I think this is not uncommon. I resolved a long-term marriage with a matter of marital settlement agreement without litigation and i think that that is not uncommon and we had a house and and we were able to resolve it and so i think that that's the idea that um that people can't do that and shouldn't have the benefit of um, a paraprofessional and assistance there i am um, i think I'll, there are many people who understand um the and and, and uh, make those choices and another thing is that um, the the parties usually don't have very high incomes. Um, those who are seeking paraprofessionals, so it's not like we're leaving thousands and thousands on the table. Um, mm -hmm. So I just wanted um, also mention that aspect of it. Yeah, I, I think Judge Wiley to answer your question, the way we had it before was that we were excluding spousal support waivers, buyouts, or non-modifiable orders in long-term marriages. But in the scenario you gave, the paraprofessional could enter to advise a client, even if it's two paraprofessionals or paraprofessional and a lawyer, in a case where it's um, a buyout termination. And in all cases, um, on the agreement, it's a non-modifiable, if it's a modifiable order, I'm less concerned. I'm worried about someone being convinced to do a termination of spousal support in a long-term marriage. And then four years later, somebody has a change of circumstances that would warrant them getting support. For example, let's say some kind of devastating medical condition. And then they've given up the right because the, they were not counseled about the consequences of terminating spousal support in a long-term marriage. But are we, um, are you not confident that they're going to be trained enough to know the ins and outs? I'm doing of, buyout. buyouts. Are waivers, the most complicated buyouts. Area. buyouts are the most complicated area I deal with in terms of spousal support. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, a lay person who knows their finances, there might be a circumstance where, well, there were, I think maybe like Linda's case, we're saying she'd have to litigate the issue. I'm constantly having to do actuarial calculations as to what the present value is of a future stream of income support. I'm having to go to the badgy tables to look at mortality rates to figure how long that support order is gonna end. It's a complicated situation in a long-term marriage. And even if the parties start off with not having assets or make it seem like, oh, this isn't that significant, it could be significant based on the change of circumstances that it could occur you know, two years, three years after the judgment's been entered. Mm -hmm. One and thing, I, I, go ahead. Wiley and then Elizabeth. I was going to say, and I, and I understand uh, your perspective, and which is why, you know, we have waivers and consents and people sign off and you have, you know, there's a mechanism um, for people to um, certainly make decisions based upon what information they have. I agree that the buyout is a little bit more um, of a complicated situation or a step down. But you know, I don't know if the cases that we're 
understandably going to be looking at if a long-term support negotiation and waiver is not appropriate for a paraprofessional to do just in a, you know, in a kind of a, a more basic case. And, uh, let, and let's talk about the alternative, right? Um, if let's say for, so sometimes the, you know, the spouse is the person who makes the decision. We can advocate all day, every day and twice on Sunday, but at the end of the day, the um, spouse is gonna make the ultimate decision. Um, and let's say that if they know that they cannot continue with the representation with the paraprofessional, they're gonna release their paraprofessional and do what they want anyway. So did we want them to have the benefit of having these conversations with these, um, with the spouse? Um, or do we just say, hey, the minute this becomes an issue piece, we're out, you know? So that's one thing to consider. So at this point, looking at our old list, it seems like we left in litigation of 4320 factors in a short-term, long-term marriage in. We just carved out waivers, bias, non-modifiables in a long-term marriage. So that's not the same as what we have in our short list, on our short list, I mean. Yeah, but so, it's what I, what I was recommending in, in, in light of the change in, in uh, based on the inclusion of in-court representation that was not anticipated when we were doing okay. that. Okay, understandable. Okay, okay. So you, you advocate for, oh, Sharon's back. You advocate for what's in the final list, spousal support, um, spousal domestic partner support in a long-term marriage be excluded? Repeat, say that one. Oh, you're so, asking Karen, right? So, so you like what is now on the short list, which is um, our exclusions, right? Yes. You want the issue of spousal partner support in a long-term marriage to be excluded from issues that paraprofessionals are authorized to handle. Correct. All together in an MSA, in a litigated case, just all together. Correct. Step down, step up, whatever. Okay. There's, um, others in the committee. There's going to have to be, this is going to be a divided recommendation. Okay. Um, I, write, yeah, go ahead. Right. I just think that with proper training, uh, that the paraprofessional should be able to handle it in an MSA. I just think to, if the parties are agreeing and the paraprofessional says, oh, well, I can do all these things on MSA, but these two paragraphs, provisions, you've got to go and see a lawyer or do it by yourself or insert it here. I, don't, I just don't think it's going to be practical, like Elizabeth said. So I, and I see it. And I see it. Um, so I would be, we can certainly put dissenting opinions. Um, Sharon had her hand up. No, I don't see her. Let me see. I, yeah, I'm here and I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had to leave. It was a meeting I couldn't avoid. Don't worry about it. Um, would you be able to give me like a 20 seconds recap of- Oh, sure. Um, just sure. Yeah. For the custody visitation, we I had the um, lone dissenting opinion because Steve is struggling um, that um, we carve out emergency um, custody visitation um, representation in court at an emergency custody visitation hearing where the court has granted the temporary emergency orders. Um, do you have a position so, on that? So a carve out for paraprofessionals to be able to represent? No, not be able to represent uh, parents in, at a, a, a emergency custody visitation hearings where the court has granted the temporary emergency orders. And what's your reasoning for Reba? So my reasoning is that when a court or grants those orders, that means the child is at the court has found at least on an emergency basis, temporary basis, that the ch child is at risk and the allegations on an ex parte basis are substantiated just until the hearing. And they're, they're, um, they're important, uh, egregious conduct, important issues. And I think that uh, it will go beyond the level of training that a paraprofessional will get. And it kind of goes into an attorney sort of arena where the arguments have to be made. Yeah, I tend to agree with you without hearing like, you know, Steve's struggle. Um, I tend to agree with you on that. Okay. So 
uh, then we moved on to spousal support. And now we are sort of not just talking about in court representation, but we're actually talking about uh, whether this issue should be included or, or a carve out should be included. So originally on, on our list to the right of your screen, uh, that's our original list, right? That temporary spousal support be included, permanent spousal support be included, whether long-term or short-term marriage uh, when, it, when it's contested. And spousal support waivers, buyouts, or non-modifiable step downs be included except for long-term marriages. In the final list to the left, and um, my apologies because that's that was I know I read that wrong. Now um, I put in um, spousal or domestic partner support in a long-term marriage. Because that whole issue, whether litigated, not litigated, be excluded altogether. And now I'm saying I I'm reversing myself, sort of, and I'm saying no, it should be excluded except for when parties have an agreement on that issue. Because I think, and I agree with Elizabeth on that, when part, when a power profession is helping parties draft their MSA, I just think it's against public policy, even it will discourage settlement by saying, oh, you can agree to all these other things, but for this one, I can't help you. And most parties will not hire attorneys, they've just you know, included themselves. Uh, include the waiver themselves. There are sample agreements out there. So I just don't think it's practical uh, nor um, uh, advisable to exclude that when the parties have an agreement. But when the parties don't have agreement, um, uh, the, the issue arguing 4320 in a long-term marriage or these other issues could be um, relatively complicated. That's where we are. Thank you so much. I didn't mean to make you backtrack, but that's very helpful. Okay. So I guess with regards to just the issue of whether we should include that issue, exclude it, carve it out, what, what are people wanting to do? One position to just include it all, just include long spousal support partners of all together without any carve outs. Of course, the other position is to carve out litigation of long-term spousal support partners. That's the default position is they get to do everything. My position is, and so the part that I want Linda to include in the memo is that I'm opposed to paraprofessionals dealing, uh, providing any representation, whether in court or out of court involving- okay, Wait, 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 wait. But don't confuse the two. Right now we're back at, ta at tasks and issues because that was a bit of a confusion right there. Okay. So I am saying that the memo needs to indicate that I'm opposed to paraprofessionals providing any services involving permanent spousal support. Whether litigated or uh, whether contested or uncontested, right? Correct. At this point, yes. Okay. And then Linda, it'd be easier for me than rather than trying to verbalize it and you try to memorialize my opposition if you give me a day or two, I can write up what my position is. And then, so you can cut and paste it into the memo. And anyone join Steve in that opinion, dissenting opinion? I, I wanna think about this some more. Um, and I'd love to, to read what Steve um, writes and just think ab about that a little bit more. May I ask for people's recollections on I have an idea about the buyout issue. And I'm, did this group ever make a, a, an agreement that said something like, we're gonna let the paraprofessional do something all the way up to X and, and at X, it has to be blessed by an attorney. The paraprofessional doesn't go away. They just go and get it looked at by a look did we we talked about it maybe with quadros and then but did we ever no we always had quadros out I, what it was on the if a paraprofessional prepared a marital settlement agreement that um in a short-term marriage the, the marital settlement agreement had to state that they had 
given a disclosure or it disclosed that the, the marital settlement agreement was paired, prepared by a paraprofessional. That's, that's what it is. Okay. I think that's what it was. Yeah, right. I don't remember that. Okay, so it's too complicated to say that paraprofessionals could do buyouts so long as the final agreement was reviewed by an attorney. Did, does that help you, Stephen? No, I remember a lot of these recommendations on the task list were developed when I thought that there wasn't going to be in court representation. I do, I do remember. I think I repeated that effusively. Uh, but the thing is that MSAs are settlements. There's not going to be any in-court action. So if the, I think what I heard Dana say was, is it okay if, the, if it's spousal support in long-term marriages is, is covered in an MSA prepared by a paraprofessional, as long as there's like a certification in there that an, an attorney X has reviewed it. Okay. So because I, I'm alone on this ship, I'm gonna take the position that it needs to be no work involving permanent spousal support. And like I said, I'll draft the memo for it or that section of the memo, Linda. Okay. Just, and just very, oh, sorry, very quickly, Steve, what is your um, general objection to that? Um, part of it's just fitting in with us for now. We wanna have a clean list of what's included or excluded. I think generally speaking, when it comes to negotiating spousal support, particularly if someone's in a power differential and they don't have an attorney representing them who's able to diagnose and assess, are they a victim of PTSD? I'm dealing with that so many times, even in a short-term marriage, it can be an eight or nine year marriage and there's been financial abuse, there's been coercive control. And if my client, you know, I'm counseling them constantly about psychological issues, trauma, that's that trauma-informed counseling we discussed before. I'm not confident or comfortable that we should supplant the, the role of an attorney with a paraprofessional in this area. I think that that does a disservice to the consumer. I think that's a concern regarding every issue, uh, the course of control right. issue when there's a settlement. Uh, I'm hoping the trauma-informed training will go a long way in helping the paraprofessionals to recognize signs of course of control, even at the playing field and know when they need to power balance, step away, get legal advice, all of that. I mean, I mean, for a lot of these things, we have to have faith that this thing will work, okay? Um, with regards to spousal support, um, specifically, I, I totally get what you're saying, so please write your... Uh, rationale um, and be ready to present it um, at the, you know, work group meeting. Um, my position is that um, 4320 litigation is some of the, one of the toughest, most complex areas, in my opinion, even a lot of attorneys don't know how to do a good 4320 argument. Judicial counsel came up with a form to help self-represented litigants by uh, putting the 4320 factors and questions, um, I, uh, that's confusing to most people. <laughs> you should see some of the forms we see. Um, so I think that I wanna carve out um, litigated uh, spousal support issue in a long-term marriage because of the level of complexity. And I think if it's litigated, then uh, an attorney should step in. Do we have any sense of how many of those cases involve self-represented litigants? Uh, the stats I have for my court is that uh, overall across our case types, about 75% of family court litigants are self-represented. The stats are a little bit, um, 75 to 80, a little bit lower for divorces. More attorneys are hired in divorce cases than let's say for parentage cases, stats for uh, independent DV action is over 90% self-represented. Okay, so I, I just want to state the obvious, which is I don't want to make an assumption that people are just going to go out and get a lawyer when we say an area is excluded. Okay. We know That's that a great point. I want to ask Judge Wiley, have you, you know, in spousal support, long-term spousal support hearings, what is your experience with um, when attorneys argue 4320 versus self-represented litigants, and in how many cases do you find yourself just being unable to order because they didn't do a good job? I'm really curious. 
well, I've never found myself being un unable to order, um, <laughs> uh, you know, a, a request on um, a long-term spousal support. Uh, 4320, if you look at the factors, which are, you know, pretty similar to 3044, they're out there laid out very clearly in the statute. And literally, I think it, to me, it's one of the more easier things to actually put into evidence is, you know, for the current spousal support, you know, you, you look at the factors and the length of the marriage. Well, everyone can tell me how long they were married. Uh, you know, you look at the educational background of, of each of the parties. Each of the parties can testify about what that is. Um, so those factors, I don't think that with the exception of the, tam the tax consequences, uh, which is the only one that I think a lot of people may have some problems uh, with. I think that most of these factors are, are readily obvious and apparent and a paraprofessional would ha not have a, a problem in marshalling that evidence and eliciting that evidence uh, from their client. So I, I think from my perspective, it's either they have an attorney and they're doing it or they don't, you know, they're doing it by themselves and I'm asking them, you know, the questions on, on their direct testimony. Mm -hmm. Well, our experience is different then. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, any other comments on this, Sharon? Yeah, I have a slightly different question from um, Dana's, which is either from your experience, Fariba, or Judge Wiley's experience, or Steve. Um, how many of the custody cases that you see involve domestic violence and a presumption? So we have a dedicated um, request for domestic violence with children calendar every Wednesday in both of our departments. Um, so we average uh, in those each of those departments on a weekly basis, I would say probably between 10 and 12 cases per week. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit uh, of an idea of what that average would be. So it, it is actually quite high uh, in terms of the times that we, we do see that. Mm -hmm. We have more DV dedicated calendars uh, uh, and uh, each all-purpose judge also has a DV calendar. So yeah, there are a lot of cases. So I, I guess I'm, I'm trying maybe to Maybe we should out... move on from this oh, topic okay. just and so that we can discuss it further at the meeting because we do have to get through the rest of the, this is our last meeting before the June 25th meeting. Right. Unless, so right. so um, I think if we, if there's agreement that there's there's sort of a dissenting opinion on this topic. Uh -huh. I don't think we need to further discuss it during this meeting. Thank you, Linda, for keeping time. Okay, could we move down on the list, please? So that brings us to property issues. Of the areas, uh, we're still on in-court representation. So of the areas that are included, um, I think we, we didn't discuss in-court representation for spousal support. Um, I think that probably the same deviating opinion as the inclusion of the issue itself. Okay. Um, anything on what's up? Okay. Yes, yeah. yeah. No, wait. Go on ahead. property issues, um, I would exclude cases in which the Combined assets exceed five hundred thousand dollars. Oh, why five hundred thousand? I went back and forth between five hundred thousand and a million. But if you've got net assets of five hundred thousand, there's sufficient funds to retain counsel. That's anybody who owns a house in the Bay Area. Oh yeah. <laughs> and doesn't have access to equity. Well, <laughs> wait, are you saying the value? I I think it needs to be. We you shouldn't include debt. Maybe you could exclude, you know, if there's a residence that's worth more than two million and or other assets worth more than, uh, so how I about, haven't figured out the numbers how about yet. Just, how about how liquid, about assets? liquid assets? What if it, about if you're limited to liquid assets? Because I think a lot of people, especially if it's a long-term marriage and, and they're not necessarily working, they really wouldn't have access to the equity in their home. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, I mean, pension, you don't have access, you're going to get penalized. Yeah, no, I wouldn't include the retirement accounts. Yeah. Um, so how about liquid assets? And you could do lower, you could do 250. Got 250 laying in an account, you can't afford an attorney. 
I'm not necessarily agreeing with that. I don't want to I don't want to bog down the meeting right now. I think my comments would take my thought process would take me a while to, to get this out. I, I'm trying to think of how to correlate it to the specific sections of a schedule of assets and debts. So I think that I don't want to use the term, you know, high dollar or high net worth case, but I think that once there's a certain amount of assets and in light of the in-court representation, I think it should be attorneys. So I agree that uh, a certain, uh, above a certain uh, dollar amount of assets or types of assets, the case gets complicated. Uh, we don't have income qualifications for our services, but we do not touch property of any sort. And we don't touch um, cases where there's a certain, there's money in it. We're just hands off because we just don't want to get involved. But I do agree with what you say that there's complexities. However, um, I am wondering if, you know, there's going to be a bruise of professional conduct requiring the uh, paraprofessional to act competently. And I wonder if we can trust them to look at a case like this and go, I just, you know, I'm just going to refer this out too much money for me. I mean, Elizabeth is here. And she talked a little bit about that before. I, I don't think every prayer professional would do that. I would think that that's a case they'd want to hold on to. As long as they can act competently. I mean, hey, maybe they can act competently. Anyway, moving on, unless somebody else wants to speak to that. I mean, I just want to highlight the fact that um, this isn't a condition put upon attorneys. Um, and also at the end of the day, um, you know, the people choose who they want representing them, if anyone at all. So maybe it's not our choice who we decide to take on. It's, you know, the public themselves. But I just wanted to state the opposition for something that was just presented. Thank you. I, I, as to for your first comment, I just want to mention, this is a limited license. So we are, that's why we're discussing limitations. Attorneys don't have a limited license. You know, they come out of law school, they could do whatever. Uh, and we would hope that they do it competently and they don't just take on any case that they look at their own competency. Okay, um, discovery. Okay, could we go down? Is that it? Those don't change. Okay. Uh, how about anything on this page so far that's included? In court representation. Okay. Enforcement. Mm, yeah, I'm fine with all that. ADR, no. ADR, that's a non issue. That's it? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we get to, I think we've, so we've already determined that, just, just so I'm clear, cons conservatorship, guardianship, and adoptions, al the, what's allowed is the paraprofessionals to sit at council table and respond to um, questions from the, from the judge. And for everything else, and, and the same thing for violence prevention, except for with the exclusion of the, although with, I, think, I don't know if we're no, no, no. left with. Actually, I yeah. think the deviation is only support, not supported by the group for adoption, conservatorship, guardianship. Am I recalling correctly that the deviation is only supported by Sharon, Steve and I? Okay. For, adop for adoption, guardianship, okay. Yeah. For violence prevention, the carve out of DV with minor children, right? That is the carve out and it's not sure if Steve and Sharon jumped on that. I know I was on that. We did. Okay. Or at least I did, I know did. I did. Okay. And um, what and else? also for violence prevention that if expert witness is, that is excluded, if that expert witness testimony is to be introduced unless there's informed consent. Yeah, I, I like uh, the language that Leah okay. 
so just said, um, do we have all the members joining in that or just Steve, Sharon and I? As to Leo's suggestion, that if there's expert testimony that client can waive by signing an informed consent to allow the paraprofessional to represent. Judge Wiley, are you okay with that? Yes. Cool, Elizabeth? I'm okay with that. Cool, and Dana? Know that I can go along to get along? Yes, I am okay with that. Yeah, it's late Friday, we gotta go and start the weekend. Okay, good. Sorry, and then what but, else? Sorry, but before you move on, um, you threw in a, a one-liner, um, I wanna make sure I heard it correctly, mm -hmm. said that um, you're trying to make it so that um, the domestic violence hearings that involve children, that that's what you're limiting it to? That's a carve out that uh, Steve, Sharon, and I uh, agreed on. I know the rest of the group didn't. On this okay. So carve out just for presenting. So it's not necessarily completely out. I just wanted to- yeah, just in, in court representation is limited to um, being in court and answering questions from the judge, direct questions from the judge. If there's children involved, yes. Okay. That's, again, that's a, that's 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 half of the group again, right? Yes. Is that correct, Stephen Sharon? If you agree, yes. say yes. 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 Okay. 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 Because the majority of these cases have children, I believe a lot of them do. Okay. Thank you. I have stats on that, but you may be right. Okay. Um, anything else? we need to discuss right now? And, and other than that, um, the, the agreement is for all the other types of cases um, listed under family law, um, full in-court representation is allowed and that we have a dissenting opinion in terms of representation and all on the task of, um, of spousal and, and uh, uh, spousal support and emergency. For a long term, for a long -term marriage, uh -huh. um, for litigation for spousal support in a long term marriage, there's disagreement on that. And also, whether they, whether they would be, whether that's allowed at all. Mm -hmm. Well, two, actually, two litigated, different right? places. Steve thinks the issue should be excluded completely mm -hmm. from the task list. Right. Right. I think. Um, um, uncontested should, only contested should be excluded. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and then there was a, my, um, my dissenting, or my deviation was as to the emergency custody visitation request, okay. remember? Right. I think I've got this all. Oh, <laughs> you are I'll amazing. I'll work on the memo and send okay. it out and hopefully I'll-, I'll So I'll before I let you go, first off, thank you, Linda, so much uh, for, I think you take minutes here, so thank you. And thank you everybody for your comments and questions. I just wanna get us ready. I will lead the presentation, but I would love all of us to be ready to answer questions and put forth our uh, rationale for uh, any positions we have taken, any deviations. And, and I will definitely be asking you guys to contribute. Um, so we've been giving, at the next meeting, enough time to present family law, which I think is gonna be the area where most these people, uh, uh, most self-representatives are gonna be utilizing paraprofessional services. So we have our chance and so I want us to be ready and I really appreciate your support. Any final comments? Thank you for Reba, that was a quite, quite a slog. <laughs> You know, Sharon has her Friday hand up. night beer and pizza, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, Sharon, you have your hands up. Here, your hand up. Yeah, it's yeah. Thank you, Linda, because I know that these these notes are probably really hard to <laughs> get down. I I'm wondering as a practical matter because we're sort of creating like a Swiss cheese <laughs> with all these carve outs. Um, how we can ensure that it's clear for the paraprofessionals. Um, you know, and maybe that comes at a later point, creating checklists, creating issue spotting tools. Um, I don't want this to, like in, in many ways, we're um, creating mincemeat. Sorry for all these food references. I must be really hungry. <laughs> <You're> hungry. <laughs> but not for mincemeat, I won't eat that. Um, 
just so that we're thinking about the practicality of all these carve outs and what it's going to look like for a paraprofessional that's trying to do a good job. That's a cons good concern. Maybe we don't have to take it on now, but have that in mind. Yeah, and I think part of the um, rationale for this switch to uh, what's excluded is it, it, uh, with that in mind, right? Because it's easier to have a short list of exclusions than a long list and sort of complicated list of what's included. But I do think it's going to be really important for both licensing and regulation to focus on, you know, ensuring that folks are really clear about their scope of practice and then creating tools to support that. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have Thank a wonderful you, everyone. weekend. Yes. Have a nice weekend. Bye. Bye.